Oh yeah! I am awake and alive. And alive. And alive. I'm so great, I gotta say it twice and cut it out once. My head's a syrup bottle that's getting tipped over every Wednesday. You're a storyteller in a storytelling podcast, and the only story you're telling now is a story about stories you don't want to tell! What the fuck?! Hey, what's happening? Mike Schmidt, 40 year old boy podcast. Uh, my hair's all fucked up, folks. I, I don't. I don't like. Uh... Ooh, I got an echo in my head. That's cool. Uh, cool, cool might not be the word I would use, as it's just literally. It, it, if you could hear what I hear, folks, it is just it is this weird, echoey. It's like ah 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 does that, and it's like it's like I'm doing the show in a canyon, folks. If, if you hear a coyote attack, please call nine one one immediately. Uh, although I don't know, this show's not live, is it? I don't think this show's not going out live. But if you hear a coyote attack, well, folks, I got news for you. Next week's show going to be delayed. Going to be very delayed. Uh, although I don't know why there would be a coyote attack and that Lily would choose to put this show up. because she, Actually, because she knows my work ethic. She knows that I hate to go away. Because I had an idea for this week, and I still do. I don't know. I might. There, this, there might not be a whole show this week, folks. I, I don't know. I'm still deciding. I'm, I'm up in the air. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, so I told Lily when I walked in, I'm like, all right, here's the idea. And she's like, that seems like a fine idea. And then she told me about 19 tramps from New York. And I'm like, all right, let's talk about that for an hour. Sounds fine with me. Uh, she had like a New York troupe at her burlesque thing last night, and I missed it. I'm, I, I, why do I miss people taking their clothes off? Why do I not go? I know her show has people taking their clothes off, and yet I don't attend. That's so stupid. I know every Monday, if I'm ever sitting there bored on a Monday, I'm like, ah, what the fuck? I could get in the car and drive 15 minutes and see naked chicks, and, and for free, because my friend Lily would be nice enough to, oh, actually, I'd smack her on the ass, and then she'd let me in, because again, as we all know, that is the key, that is the code, that is the way you get in the door. Uh, but it sounds like if I would have seen these New York chicks, I would have been a smack and a lot more ass than Lily's. Holy Holy shit, these girls were uh, they were <laughs> up for up for breakfast and out for business and ready to do some damage. Uh, I, I heard a, to- a tale, a sordid tale of one of these people that I cannot relate to you, but oh my word, I, uh, if only I had, let's put it this way, I wish I liked bowling. That's all I'm going to say to you folks, because it sounds like, I look, I've been bowling and I don't mind it. I truly don't mind it. However, it sounds like the game is a lot different than I remember. <laughs> Uh, and if only, if only the game had been this interesting when I was a youth, perhaps now I would be on tour. It sounds like, cause bowling is like, you're like, ah, whatever. It's a fried food and some beer and scores of over a hundred. Maybe, maybe if you're lucky, but that's not what I'm hearing now. I'm hearing now that someone, although it's funny, I always thought at golf, you got a hole in one, but apparently it's at bowling. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't go into it, uh, but that's all you need to hear. Why not? So, uh. Yeah, I would. I, I wish bowling were this interesting because I would be like Steve Jaros. That's right. You don't know who Steve Jaros is. Steve Jaros went to my high school and then became a pro bowler. Like, like amazingly, he was always good at bowling in school. He was one of those dudes. Like, because we had a uh, fair, fair lanes, Fairmont lanes. I, I don't know. I don't remember the fucking name. Because uh, I, I always wanted to be Gala West shooting pool. I didn't play fucking bowling. Because bowling just seemed like ludicrous. Like you had to go and rent shoes. Fuck that. I'm not putting on anybody else's shoes. I barely want to put on my shoes for fuck's sake. I don't like shoes. But you know what? I hate being barefoot. Let's go. Let's go that route. All right. <laughs> I will not be barefoot at all, but if it means renting shoes to keep my feet dry, I don't know if I can do that. I'm not a rental shoe di- uh, guy, not a fan. Like, if I was one of those idiots who bought his own bowling shoes, like I, like a dude who owns his own tuxedo, maybe I could pull that off. But And, I, and that even seems like a ridiculous waste of money. Guys who, look, if you own a tuxedo, you're just a, a dandy fop, and nobody likes you. Nobody. You know, and you know how I can prove that? Very rarely are you invited to events where you can bust out that fucking tuxedo you own. <laughs> You bought it, it looked good, you're like, ha-ha, this is great, and it looks really good in your closet, doesn't it? You know where you should wear it? Bowling. Because I've heard now that there's a classy sort of dame at the bowling alley who inspires tuxedo wear. Wow, where did that baseball bat go? All right, so, how did I miss that? I gotta go bowling more often. All right, so, folks, a lot of clues here, a lot of things for you to solve. This is a very, this is a choose-your-own-adventure podcast. You can go down the bowling alley lane with me and find out where it ends up, or you can go ahead and buy your own tuxedo and see where you end up at home with a closet full of formal wear that you'll never wear ever in a billion years, unless you break it out at your own house. You watch like the end of Top Chef Masters with your own tuxedo on like you're there tasting the food, you idiot. Sell your tuxedo right now. Have a yard sale and sell your custom made tuxedo. 
The only way, the only reason you should have a custom made tuxedo if there's a pigeon living in it, and you pull it out in front of children. Otherwise, you buy a fucking tuxedo for yourself. Get bombs. Nobody wants to see you and your bullshit formal wear. Go, go, wear somebody else's pants like the rest of us. But then I'm very anti-renting shoes. I don't know. I can't decide, folks. I'm see. I'm a. I'm a mystery wrapped in an enigma, stuffed inside of a riddle, inside of an empanada. <laughs> mystery empanada. Oh, those are delicious. Mmm. That's what you do. Go to whatever wherever sells empanadas, and they're like, "What do you want?" Just go. Surprise me. <laughs> oh my God, will they? Uh, th- that's often what I like. I like to go and order mystery food. Uh, so what was I talking about? I had something that I launched into this with something from the beginning. Oh, you know what I talked about? My fucking hair, folks. Here's the thing. Uh, because I don't know my hair, as we all know, I'm old, so my hair is falling out, but it's kind of slowed down. I think it's sort of stopped and, uh, and I've been cutting my hair, but now I'm letting it grow. So, uh, you know, if you saw my passport photo, like, here's the thing, my passport photo looks awful. I mean, I know I look like a junkie or something, not even like I I look like a, a fucking, you know, I look even worse. I look like a filthy European. That's what I look like, as I've mentioned many times, but I love it. I fucking love it. I love the way it looks. So I'm like, you know what? Maybe I got to keep my hair longer because I actually went and got my hair cut. Uh, the last time was before Cleveland and I walked in and she cut it, but she kept a lot of the length because I always say, I don't want to lose a lot of the length. And then as I walked to the car, I chickened out. I go, this is, this, this is, it's like, I didn't even get a haircut. Like I got the sides and the back buzzed, but the top wasn't even cut. And I'm like, oh man, that's going to be creepy. So I walked in, I go, you know what? You got to You got to fix it for me. And she's like, all right, what do you need? And I showed her the picture of, uh, of Jimmy Donaghy, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, from Boardwalk Empire, and she's like, well, I never knew that it went, it was all one length right to the back there. She goes, I thought you wanted it kind of layered. I go, no, it's supposed to be all one thing all the way to the back. And uh, by the way, that doesn't inspire confidence that my girl's been cutting my hair for uh, like a year, at least like this. A year, year and a half I've had this cut, and she's like, oh yeah, I never saw it from that angle before. Hey, you're the one behind my head, all right? I can't I can't stand up and point at my skull and go, that's wrong. I wish I could. God damn, I wish I could. Uh, but sure enough, she's like, oh yeah, I never saw it from that angle. Then she cut it and it looked fucking fabulous. I loved it. But as it grows, I kind of like it and it gets a little stringy. I know, but if I put enough gunk in it, it works. Like it adds, uh, it adds volume to it and it lets it, it gives it heft, a little bit of hang. God damn it. My head's, my head's a cock. My hair's a cock. <laughs> um, so I can't decide. So I've been monkeying around, but like I have three different products that I put in my hair. Not all at once. Jesus Christ. I'm not a, look, I'm not a scientist, folks. All right. I can't. I'm not about to have a hat trick in my head. I'm going to, I just go, I use one at a time. So uh, I have one uh, bottle of Paul Mitchell, heavy stylizing volume, whatever the fuck. And, uh, and that was a gift to me, by the way, from a listener, our, my, our friend Jill in Milwaukee. Yes. Uh, she gave it to me along with my killer shrimp uh, gift passes because she was apologizing for yeah, fucking screaming at me when I was when she was here in Los Angeles. Uh, but then it was, she, she was very nice and gave me a gift and, uh, and I, I appreciate it very much. So I still use that, you know, because I only use a fucking, you know, dollop of it or whatever. Uh, so I use that. That's my that's usually my daily go to hair stuff. Why are you making what are you making fun of? A dollar, that's what he's supposed to, because well, they always say put that something the size of a dime. I've talked about this on here before, where I don't know how to fucking handle it. It's like, I'm, dude, dude, I've never been good with squeeze bottles, ever. It's like, because I, you know, part of me wants to just get a certain amount out, but part of me wants to prove my manhood to everyone within a fucking four mile radius, so I squeeze the fuck out of it, and all of a sudden, there's ketchup everywhere. And I was just putting in hair gel. How the fuck did ketchup get everywhere? That's how hard I squeeze that fucking bottle. My grip is so strong, I squeeze the fucking hair gel bottle and sh- turn it into ketchup. I'm a goddamn hair gel alchemist with a heavy duty fucking left hand grip because I got to grip left hand because dollop goes in the right hand and then it smooths right in and then both hands go to work on your hair. Anyway, that, no, that's neither here nor there, folks. You don't need to know about my hair processes. Process I. Uh, so I so I use the the daily. I use the Paul Mitchell thing if I if I'm throwing stuff in my hair because I've come to the uh, the conclusion now that if I'm uh, not doing anything, like if I'm just going to sit in that fucking godforsaking horrible office where I work, uh, I don't put shit in my hair. And, and then but then by the end of the night, holy god, what a rat's nest I've got in my head. Um, so I, I kind of like putting stuff in. Well, whatever, who cares? Uh, and my hair's become, it's actually it's come to expect it. My hair's like a like a gel junkie. Like my hair, because if you don't give it what it wants, it misbehaves and it acts out. And my hair actually stole a television. <laughs> I couldn't even get it out. <laughs> it stuck off my hair, my head in the middle of the night and pawned a television. I was so furious. I woke up the next day, my TV's gone. God damn you, junky hair. But it wants gel. And you know what pisses me off is my junky hair climbs off my head. It could have gone in the cabinet and just applied gel to itself. But no, to teach me a lesson, it took my television and pawned it. Fuck you, junky gel hair. (laughs) 
So, so that's what my hair, my hair's angry at me if I don't put stuff in it. So now I got to put stuff in it all the time. So I have this Paul Mitchell that I've been using all the, I use it all the, uh, every day, but now I'm finding as my hair gets longer, uh, the, the, the Paul Mitchell is, it's, it has no sway over my head. It does not do what it's supposed to do. It held, it holds down the front. The fort in the front is fine, but then the back where it's longer and it gets a little stringier, it, it kind of, it's starting to curl and loop a little. Uh, and I don't, I don't mind it like in my passport, it looked good, but when it's curling and it's kind of falling, it just doesn't look good. It, it's, uh, it, it, it adds body, but it adds a dead body, which is not attractive to anybody. <laughs> So, uh, so I have this other hair gel that I read about in Esquire magazine a year ago before my hair started falling out relentlessly. And I'm like, hey, I would actually like to buy this stuff because it's supposed to make my hair look good. Uh, it's from Redken. And it's, uh, uh, it's a funky little gel. And it's kind of a cross. Well, it's more of a gel. It's a gel. And that's what I have in today. Uh, but the problem is I, I look like Bob Geldof in Pink Floyd the Wall when he was having the hallucination that he was a Nazi leader. I mean, it's like... <laughs> My hair is so slicked back and it's not, and the back, because normally, you know, when I slick it back with the Paul Mitchell, that happens and then it kind of falls a little bit. This hair is not moving. My hair, you could skip a fucking dime off this hair and it would go for about four blocks. Jesus Christ. My head is just, it is, I, I, I look like a GI Joe, but not, but not like, I look like an Italian GI. I look like a GI Giuseppe. That's what I look like. Cause I look total greaseball, fucking Dago slicked back hair, wife beater, Prince, you know, and it's a good thing because, you know, as you're listening to this, oh no, actually, no, it's not. I was going to say you're listening on Wednesday. Wednesday is Prince Spaghetti Day. God damn it. <laughs> I'm furious because I was going to say I'm recording this on Prince Spaghetti Day, but I'm not because as we all know, I'm recording this on Tuesday because I'm on a plane as you listen. Well, no, I'm not on the plane still. Jesus Christ, that's the longest flight of all time. Hold on. I'm on a plane tomorrow morning uh, on Wednesday morning and I'm flying to Kansas City. Um, let's deviate from the hair for just a second to address this. Buy some fucking tickets. <laughs> Kansas City. Uh, it's nice. There are people there who are like, oh, yeah, I'm thinking about it. Or, oh, you know, I'm I, my, one. <laughs> there was a guy on Facebook. He's like, dude, I swear I'm going to buy a ticket. I'm just trying to convince some of my friends to go with me. And it's like, uh, I, I, and that's cool. You don't have to tell me I promise I'm buying a ticket. I mean, it's cool if you buy a ticket and that's great. People who like the show, I'm not yelling at you. I don't know who I'm yelling at when I say please buy tickets. It's just a failed experiment. It's all. It's like I got spoiled by the Kickstarter cities because you know what happened? Four Kickstarter cities are the last four shows that I did, uh, not counting San Francisco, but San Francisco bought tickets. But the, the four Kickstarter cities were funded by you guys. So uh, I could take chances. I could, I could, you know, get the theater and hotel and all these different things. And uh, it, it worked out better. Well, Kansas City, man, I, I mean, I'm, I am right now, I've covered my flight. It's not even a joke. I've got, I've got hotel and, uh, and everything else. And that's not your fucking problem. You don't care. Come out to the show. It'll still be great. I mean, I don't give a fuck if there's five of you there. I'm still going to do the show and it's going to be good. But at the same time, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> this experience is making me think about scheduling shows and where I schedule them from now on. Because uh, Kickstarter, again, it, it gave me a safety net where I could just go ahead and f book these shows. And, and also, I got a little spoiled. You know, I got killed in Philadelphia. lost a ton of money there. But then when I worked in New York, my, uh, my friend, the producer, David Williams, uh, played playwright producer uh fan of sweet genius david williams he went ahead and paid for the theater uh and so it made new york more palatable for me so in my head i'm like hey i gotta get back to new york well yeah david williams isn't gonna run a fucking theater every time you go to goddamn new york it's not gonna happen so i need to figure out uh and and my favorite thing is people are really nice and they're like dude you should have another kickstarter like uh because i've been thinking about a kickstarter for london and people are like you should have a kickstarter to come back to new york uh and i'm like those are great ideas I don't have anything else to offer you people. I, I don't I, I don't know what rewards I could possibly give you uh, that would uh, make you want to donate or give anything. Uh, you'll blow guys? Is that what you'll do? No, no, it looks like you're going to blow guys for me. Hold on, guys. I have a reward <laughs> that I think you'll be very interested in. Uh, Lily's doing that uh, the hand with the tongue and the cheek thing, like, like that. And I'm like, well, if you're volunteering, then yeah. <laughs> I don't know what tier that's going to be, and I don't know. Well, we'll have to make that a high-paying tier, probably. Oh, yeah, you're going to be crying. Um, no, if, see, because here's the thing. If we make blowjobs from you the $20 tier, I mean, you know, no offense. You're, you're going to be busy, but I'm going to make a ton of dough. Because uh, i got to figure if I make it like the like the $300 tier, we'll get five. So you only got to get five blowjobs then, and I make that, uh, that much money, which is good. But if I make it the $20 tier, I bet we make three times that amount of money. But then you're giving out fucking, what, 80 blowjobs? Which, uh, you know, I got to be honest. That's, I, I, you know what? Actually, you know what the $1,000 tier is? Video of Lily giving the 80 blowjobs. I think that works out perfect. 
you'll have to wait a little bit. But yeah, everybody everybody who donates twenty bucks gets a blowjob from Lily, and anybody who donates a thousand dollars gets a videotape of Lily blowing all the dudes from the twenty dollar tier. God damn it. Oh, I can't think of anything more depressing. I would fight everybody if they tried to get it get that from you. I can't have them collecting that from you. That's awful. I just saw a video, a thing this weekend, like I was on Reddit or 4chan or somewhere I shouldn't have been, and uh, and it was a picture. It might have been was it 7chan? I might have been on 7chan. 7chan. Yeah, yeah, terrible. Uh, I, I'm still I, I'm waiting to get into the dark web, folks. As soon as I get into the dark web, I'll tell you. And then <laughs> actually, you won't need to hear anything else from me because someone will steal all my passwords and clean it out, and I'll be dead. I'll be I'll get sucked into my computer like Tron. Oh my god. You know what? If I if I ever make it to the dark web, I'll get sucked in like Tron, but instead it'll be Tran, and I'll be I'll get sucked into Tran Chan, and you'll never see me again as I'm just dodging fucking chicks with dicks for months on end in my uh, and I'm throwing a disc at them trying to collapse their fucking their light platform. All right, uh, um, the fuck was I talking about? <laughs> talking about a Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, but you jumped in with blowing dudes, you, which was nice. It was nice of you to verify that. I'm gonna blow dudes. Oh, I gotta charge a lot if I'm gonna be blowing dudes. Okay, that's it's, it's gonna be brutal. Uh, all right. Um, actually, and guys are gonna be pissed. The guys will probably charge me because I mean I, I I'm not any good at it. The first ten guys, you know what? The first ten guys, you, uh, th- that's the the twenty dollar tier. But then after that, it's got to move up because I got to get good. Then right after the first ten guys, I actually have to learn. Uh, the first ten guys are my learner's permit. All right, I gotta blow ten of you just so I can go ahead and get behind the wheel. <laughs> Without without an instructor in the passenger seat, so that's it. Lily's my. You know what? We're gonna get in a simulator. We have to get in a blowjob simulator, and you got to sit right next to me so you can actually control the pedals if you have to. And I'll blow ten dudes, but then by that point, I'm free to go ahead with my learner's permit and take the road. That's good. I like this. We need a blowjob simulator. You sit in the passenger seat and make sure I'm doing it right. And after the first ten, I graduate. I get my license. Okay. This suddenly went from raising money to something a lot stranger. This is your fault. I wasn't saying, I wouldn't go down that road. That was the first thing you thought of. I'm trying to offer things and you're like, hey, blow these dudes. What? You're so basic. You're so base. How low can you go? Death row. What a brother now. Once again, back is the incredible rhyme animal. The uncannibal D. Fuck yeah, public enemy, folks. All right, so. Um... Maybe, maybe one of those tears will be in a bowling alley. Maybe we have that happen, folks. Email me and I'll tell you what happened in the bowling alley. All right. Um, so, so, uh, where was I? I was talking about something. Oh, uh, going I places. Buy for City. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, Kansas City. Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be bad. It's so I I, I wound up I'm I'm gonna wind up losing. And what's funny to me, or right, here's the thing, uh, I've booked another show. All right, and I have a date to announce and tell you about. It's coming up. Um, but I'm gonna sit here and bitch about how Kansas City. I'm gonna make no money. It's gonna I'm I'm just gonna totally tank being there and making no cash and then i've booked a show in a, like an even more remote place like it's the dumbest thing ever uh but it just it just happened and i was like well you know what it presented itself and i love doing the show i really like going out and doing it live so uh it made sense to do it but at the same time i, I this place is gonna make kansas city look like fucking you know the boston or portland where i actually sold tickets for fuck's sake uh and chicago and new york you know major metropolitan centers but instead i went ahead and booked something in the woods because I am not smart. Uh, all right. Uh, so I was talking about Kansas City. Yeah, so that's coming up. Buy some tickets. I actually called them today. I haven't talked to them since I booked the show. She's like, you know, we never got any promo from you, any posters or anything. And that's on me. Because I, I usually, I don't like reaching out to the general public because they are gonna, you know, they don't know what they're getting into. They're going to come to a three-hour show and sit there and stare. And although this was the opportunity to reach out to the general public because it's in a fucking coffee house. Holy shit, go upstairs and get four espressos and you'll be with me for three and a half hours. It's fine. I can't I won't be able to out talk your coffee buzz. Go upstairs and get plowed, come downstairs, and I'll talk until you pass out. And you that's but that's what I should make Kansas City. It should just be a marathon of me talking. It shouldn't even be like a time limit or we wait till the end of the fucking show. I should just talk and goddamn talk until your coffee buzz wears off and then we'll all shake hands and go home. Because there's no way your coffee buzz is gonna wear off. It's a it's a coffee house. So like you're downstairs, you're snorting coffee fumes from the second we sit down there. Not only is it coursing through your veins, but now it's going right into your fucking head. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so so buy tickets for fucking Kansas City. They're on sale right now, and it's uh, and people are very nice, and they're 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 uh, reaching out and trying to help. And I, there's nothing you can do to help. It's just buy a ticket. That's all you can do to help. And I appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we, it's not like I can show up like the Blues Brothers and start driving around on the beach and, you know, hey, you two girls, you on the water skis. Uh, I'd love to get a crowd that way, but it's, it's not going to happen. 
Um, although, shockingly enough, I have Cab Calloway Jr. opening the show in Kansas City. Uh, Duck Dunn just died. He won't be there, unfortunately. And you know what? We'll never get Mr. Fabulous. All right. <laughs> um, so, the fuck was I talking about for Kansas City? Uh, my hair. Yeah, that's it. You know what? My hair. So, so right now, I am, I am straight up white power with my hair. It's slicked way back, and it is, uh, it is crazy. There's no... It, it, there's no body or volume to it. It's just flat. I, I, my head looks like a skating rink. I mean, it's brutal. Um, so those are the two products that I, I, I use. And then there's a third product, which I actually uh, really, really like, which I use the night of shows, which you'll see in Kansas City, folks. Or right now, if you go to Facebook and look at all the pictures of me, you'll know that I have my favorite hair thing in there. My, my favorite hair juice. Uh, it's cream, actually. It's not, it's not gel. It's like a white paste. And uh, it, Karen got it from her old job at Procter & Gamble. Yes, that's how long I've had it. Because it's been sitting on a shelf in my one, well, the only shelf I have. I don't have a lot of shelves. I'm a married man. Uh, it's not like I get multiple shelves for all my toiletries. I have one shelf where all my shit goes. That's it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, before I had to fucking put stuff in my hair, it all just sat there on the shelf mocking me, saying, oh, you know what? You're going to need this eventually. And I'd laugh. <laughs> and I'd flip it off. Because I could just wash my hair and walk out the door because my hair was free-flowing and gorgeous. It looked amazing. looked good. I looked like Thor. Fuck that. I didn't look like Thor. That, that's going too far. I do not look like Thor. I, you know what? I look like Thor's fat brother, Thunk. That's what I looked like. Thunk. Uh, <laughs> didn't carry a hammer. He had a big spoon. The spoon of Mjolnir. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Take that, nerds, and run with it. And as you get farther the distance, I will throw my spoon at you and will scoop you. All right. Uh... <laughs> My sp- I have a spoon named Mjolnir. You know what, folks? Honestly, you have no idea how fucking lucky you are to listen to me. I am a genius. Why are you at home now? You're sitting there. Because none of this went... I, I, I was going to have a rerun. I was going to have a fucking rerun for you people, and I still might. I still haven't decided. Maybe that's why I'm so free right now, because I know I have a safety net. Anytime, I could shut up and still get a show. I have a show locked and loaded in the pipeline. It's like Russian roulette, and the next time I pull the trigger, I know that I'm going to blow my brains out with a fucking awesome show. And it's still there lurking. It's it's the specter of that is just hovering over what I'm talking about right now. And yet I continue to yammer about hair. All right. Uh, so. So I don't know what the point of was telling you about my three hair gels. Uh, actually, you know what? I, I, I have to tell you, unfortunately, a wolf came and he blew in their houses. And uh, it was it was awful. It was the three little hair gels. And I even they even lived. They were in on my shelf. That's the thing. They were on my shelf and the wolf came and he huffed and he puffed and he blew in the fucking cabinet. God damn it. And that's where all of my stuff went. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kansas City, why? why? Why are you doing this to me? I don't get it. Uh, I, I, hey, I had, a four, I had a parking coup today, by the way. I should tell you that. It's Tuesday, folks. I'm recording on a Tuesday here to talk to my friend Lily Bunched Up. Hey, she's over there, by the way. Hey, Lily. Hi. Hi. I, uh, you know, I come to the oldest building in Hollywood and I have to park downstairs. And uh, sometimes if I don't get to, I have to park next door in what is now the Dolby theater it was the kodak theater uh on hollywood and highland uh, highland don't say it like that if you come here do not say hollywood and highland because there can be only one way to pronounce it it's highland <laughs> uh oh god really honestly i'm funny back it up and listen again if, if you did, if you ever think i'm not funny listen to the first 20 minutes of the show and realize i had nothing at all to talk about <laughs> If anybody, you know what, in Kansas City, you want to convince your fucking friends to come, play this 20 minutes for them. Hey, listen to this guy. He's like a savant of stupid. You want to come paying 20 bucks to see him? Yes, you do. Because you have no idea what the fuck he's going to say. Uh, and neither do I. That's the best part of it, folks. I don't have any idea what the fuck I'm going to say. I didn't know I was going to say this part. I certainly didn't know I was going to extol my genius to you with a head like a skating rink. I didn't know that was going to fucking happen. I didn't know I was going to tell you about the fact that I look like uh, G.I. Giuseppe and a wife beater. Come on, damn it. I think back. I just want to repeat the first 20 minutes because it was so great. Holy shit, I'm funny. By the way, you know who doesn't think I'm funny? Let's get into that for just a second, folks. Let's go ahead and talk about who doesn't think I'm funny. Because here's the thing. I start talking, and I don't know exactly where it's going to end up. I don't know where it's going to wind up. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we, we go without a net. Although I, this week, we have a net. As I've mentioned, we, uh, we may be able to put a rerun in here at some point. I might. I still haven't decided. I might. It depends. If I ever wind up, uh, uh, if I stop talking or I wind up getting tired of talking, I'll just lean back, point at Lily. She pulls the trigger. Boom. I blow your head off with a fucking fancy show from the past. Uh, you may remember last week, folks, I came on and I had a question for all of you. I, I wanted to get to your answers right now. I asked you some questions. I said, uh, hey, if you were going to offer me a job, 
If you were going to say to me, hey, Mike, I, I want you to have this job, and then I was going to say, yes, I accept that job, would you then? Would it be fair then for you to come back and go, hey, um, we need you to prove that you can have that job? I talked about this last week in the beginning of the show, and I talked about it for quite a while, and I, I referenced something, and I wanted to hear what you guys genuinely thought. Like, did you, seem that was like a, did you think that was maybe like an Indian giver sort of way to be? Or did you think that just made sense? Like they, were, they offered something, and then I accepted, and then they, want, they wanted follow-up. Uh, especially after I had said, hey, man, I'll do whatever you need. Well, then when they asked me to do whatever they needed, I blanched, and I went ahead and told you guys about it. Uh, well, here I am uh, going to tell you that um, they no longer need me to, uh, to let them know uh, if I'm qualified for that job, because last week's show convinced them that I'm not. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's always funny because I talk about this show and I'm like, hey man, if anybody ever fucking listened to it, they would just hear the, it's like, it, it's, it's like funny demigloss. You know what I mean? It is, it is funny boiled down to its essence. That's, that's what I bring you folks. There's no extraneous bullshit. It's just funny mainline right into your goddamn veins. You know what? You can buy heroin and you see what it looks like. I'm the heroin post spoon. That's what I am. Cook me up and shoot me in. That's what the fuck I'm already in your gear. Spoon is bent. H- heat has been provided. Heroin has turned into juice, and I've already sucked up into your needle. Jam me into your fucking eyeball, and let's go. Let's fucking go. Fuck your eyeball eardrum. Jam me into your fucking eardrums, and let's run with it. Because this is funny, boiled down to its essence, and it is a, it is a quick shot of... Well, not quick. Let's be honest. It's not quick at all. There's nothing quick about this. I mean, it is... Uh, it, it's not just... You know what? This show is not just a heroin shot. I, I'm going to take that back. This show is not just a heroin shot. This show is the whole process of getting hooked on heroin. That's what this show is. This show is finding a guy who's a reputable dealer and being introduced to him and then finding out if he has decent... You know what? This fucking show is the trip to Eric Stoltz's house for Travolta in Pulp Fiction. That's what this is. Because you show up at my house and I'm here and I'm eating fruit brute and I let you in and then I go ahead and I show you my bed and I go, look, there's Panda, there's Bava, and there's Choco. And Choco is a fucking madman and you know what what do you do you pull out your roll you take off your 14 uh, uh you know rubber bands off your goddamn wad and you tell me about a guy who keyed your car and i go i don't want to hear your stories i'm the one doing all the fucking talking and then i just blast you and then we fucking roll that's it that's what this show is so so that's for that's what it is for you guys you know what it is for the committee that i mentioned last week something they're not interested in at all Let's put it this way. If they didn't like last week, they're certainly not going to like this week comparing this show to getting hooked on heroin. Uh, Because I talked last week, as you know, I mentioned over and over about the committee and how there was this mysterious committee and these people had reached out to me and wanted me to do something. Uh, I don't think I I, I didn't want to go into it last week because, uh, you know, it was still in play. But now that it's out of play, perhaps I should tell you about it and exactly what it was. Um, and, And look, I should I should tell you this. All right. Uh, I do not blame these people at all they this is their decision and their choice and uh it was nice of them to even think of me and offer me something like this uh as i i'm do i agree with it with their decision i don't uh i mean i i respect it and i understand they can do whatever the fuck they want but the then they should understand that i can do whatever the fuck i want but whatever uh, that's fine because uh they canceled me here's why they canceled me all right Uh, because it was look and again i should tell you i didn't have the gig I had no gig. We were still in the formative. uh, It was a university. All right. And uh, it was some people associated with the university who wanted me to come and speak to uh, not. I don't think the entire student body because it's a huge university. (laughs) Holy shit. (laughs) They were renting me a blimp. I was going to get a blimp and it was going to say the 40 year old boy on the side and I was going to have a loudspeaker and I was going to tell them all about things uh, about heroin. (laughs) But uh, no, it was it was a, a they were going to have me speak. At a, I don't want to say a symposium or a class or a gathering. All of this was still to be decided. But uh, they have a diversity week. And they were interested in having me. The, uh, the, the gentleman who contacted me listens to the show. And uh, he was telling me that, and I, I, I don't want to get this wrong. It was either his wife or his girlfriend. I believe it was his girlfriend. She works for the university and she heard some of the show. And she thought that I would be good to come and speak at Diversity Week. And he was very excited about that because he likes me and he likes the show. So he contacted me and he said, hey, this is the way it would work. You would come here. He, he, all he did was he wanted a quote from me. He wanted to know what it would cost for me to make the trip. So I thanked him for thinking of me and I gave him a quote uh, of, you know, money and I, you know, what I would need. And he was like, here's the thing. There's also a black box theater here, like either in town or on the campus. You can come and do, well, you know, if they accept your fee, you can come and do the talk. 
and also book your one man and sell tickets because we draw from Pennsylvania. You know, it's, I don't want to say where it was, but it was it was centrally located in a place where we would be able to get people from you know multiple states. And uh, and fuck, maybe the people who were you know the the students who saw me talk at the uh, the symposium or whatever would come out and buy tickets too as well. Uh, so it would have worked out perfect. I would have had a speaking gig, which would have been covered, and I would have made money, and then I could have actually booked another gig. So I was very excited about it. I was excited to be thought of, and uh, and I told him so. And so we were going through the process of him contacting me and then putting me in contact with his girlfriend. I believe it was his girlfriend, and uh, she was going to submit me to the committee. And what they wanted here's here's all right. Here's what they wanted me to talk about, folks. Uh, they wanted me to talk to them about my experiences with bullying, uh, and or. Uh, weight issues um, because it, and so here's the the gist of what I was talking about last week they wanted me to talk about bullying or weight issues and I said great I will be happy to put together a whole presentation for that that's fine uh, because it was diversity week and they wanted me you know to be one of the guys who came out and talked that's fine so um, but then what, what what it was is after they said that I said great and then they said okay well what episodes do you think we should play for the committee to let them know and I fucking panicked because I went hey wait a second um, you do know that there's a ton of swearing like in these episodes and I won't do that on stage if you don't want me to. I mean, I'm happy to, I can, I can do whatever you want me to do, you know, but I, I, I just, I'm worried that the swearing is going to like end the gig. And they were like, well, no, they'll understand because we'll tell them whatever. So just, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us what episodes they should be? And that's what I was talking about last week. Cause it's like, well, you listen to the fucking show. Shouldn't you know the episodes? I mean, you told you specifically decided I should come out and talk about bullying and weight issues. Where in the time you've been listening to me were those covered? Like, don't you know? <laughs> you must have heard me reference them at some point. And they actually said, "What about the show where you beat up the car?" And uh, and I was like, I was going to take that story. I was going to say, "All right, yeah, that's a good story." And also the uh, you know sad cast from year one would have been one to use for the weight issues, and then also for the one where I rededicated myself to becoming a uh, getting in shape. And then I mean, I've, I've talked about it a million fucking times and never done it, as you know. Um, so I mean, there's plenty of things that we could talk about, and also I thought of the uh, the episode where I talked about Woody uh, in school, where we tied him to a tree, and uh, and we were awful to him, awful. I wasn't because I was I was in internally whatever. I don't need to excuse it to you guys. So, so I was like, all right, well, I mean, I get, in my head, I was like, I guess I'll I'll find some stories. That's fine. Uh, and then I came on and I told you guys about it, and I said what I said last week, um, and I figured that. Having listened to the show in the past, he would know who I was as a guy, meaning that it's a comedy show and it's a- kind of amped up a little bit. I mean, and I talk about whatever the fuck I want, because le- uh, let me tell you this, folks, this is my fucking show. OK, <laughs> I don't have a fucking boss. Uh, I don't have an executive to come in and tell me, well, maybe that's probably not going to go over with the other people. No, I, I don't care. I don't care. That's why I do this show. So I can have the freedom to do whatever the fuck I want. I can talk about what I want. I can say what I want whenever I want. I did an entire show on Haitian rape vans. I mean, I just, whatever comes up, comes out. That's the whole point. Talking at the speed of your head. No filter, no future. I, I've talked about this many times. So I, I want to talk about the things I want to talk about and whatever comes out. I talked about zombies eating people's faces and, and people living in storm dreams. I don't fucking care. Whatever is on my mind is going to come out here because that is the essence of having your own show. Um, conversely, I would hope you know that if you hire me for an event, um, I will adhere to whatever it is you need me to adhere to. <laughs> if we've talked and I've said, hey, thanks for thinking of me. That's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. And, uh, you know, I could go ahead and give a talk. And then you hear my show and you hear me talking about jamming popsicles in my ass. You need to realize that's on my show that I'm talking about jamming popsicles in my ass. It's not <laughs> I'm not doing a trial run going. I can't wait till I get to that university so I can talk about the bullying aspect of putting popsicles in your ass. <laughs> it's not happening. And uh, and but they uh they didn't feel that way. So last week's show, you know, when I talked all about it, I and I, uh, it didn't take long. I'll tell you that. The next day, I got an email, and it just said, "Hey, uh, you sounded really angry on yesterday's show." Uh, and and the guy and the guy, he's the fan of the show. He said, "Hey, I laughed through the show because uh, you know, as always, you have a way of presenting things to where it's just funny, no matter what. But you sounded really angry, particularly at me and my uh, girlfriend. And I don't understand why you would do that. We were reaching out to you with an opportunity, and and I'm." Um, and he also said, uh, you don't, and this is, I think this is, was his point is he said, you don't understand that the committee, we have to give them your name and who you are. They will be listening to your show to find out 
about you and probably this episode since we're going there this week. So to have their decisions, uh, to have their decisions compared to fruit flavored anal rape probably would not go over very well. And I, and, and I, and I was, I'm reading it and I'm, I'm simultaneously laughing at the absurdity of anybody ever listening to that show and believing it or thinking that it was true. And also simultaneously furious that someone who listens to the show and gets it and gets me, as I've said, I've alluded to this before. People love the show. All right. There are people out there who love the show until they don't (laughs) until I talk about the thing that they can't stand. Or I talk about the thing that pushes a button that reminds them of something that happened when they were younger. Or I talk about the thing that reminds them that I shouldn't have the privilege that I do. And I should really think twice about going ahead and saying those things because it's offensive to them, (laughs) them period. As if I do the show for them in the least, in the fucking least, I do the show for me. I'm glad that you're along. I hope you guys think it's funny. I know I do. I think it's fucking hysterical. Uh, but I was so disappointed that this guy who is a fan and has heard the show, the, the fact, just the phrase, I, even, I forwarded it to Lily and I said, on the bright side, fruit flavored anal rape is a great album name for the next <laughs> album that I put out. Uh, but it was a long description about how basically that, uh, uh, let's put it this way. He felt this way, but his girlfriend really felt this way. She was not happy when she heard the show. And uh, I guess she thought that I was either making fun of them or her or making fun of the opportunity or I don't know. But the point is I do this show so I can say all the things that I want to say. And if I show up on your campus, Hey, I'll yes, ma'am. And no ma'am, everybody. And I'll give a fuck. And this is the thing that drives me crazy. I would have been great. I would have been mesmerizing. I would have been fantastic. Young people would have looked at me and heard me talk about life experience and said, oh my God, we don't want to be like that guy. I would have saved an entire generation of children on the East Coast. Don't you realize that? Don't you realize the opportunity you've missed? I would have been a cautionary tale they would have remembered forever, for years. I would have been the guy they would have told their children about. I would have been the fucking sleep... I would have been like the boogeyman. I would have been the guy, the fat guy from the West Coast who came and lived under their bed and told, and scared them straight for fucking ever. So I saw the email and I read it and he's just like, yeah, my girlfriend totally is is out and the committee's going to listen this week and if they hear this, they're going to be out. They don't want to be compared to fruit flavored anal rape and it's like, I don't understand what's wrong. Like he, all of a sudden, he forgot who I was. You know what I mean? I, like I, I was funny, I was relating it the story to Karen and, uh, and the line I used was, hey man, you fucking knew I was a scorpion. You know what I mean? Which is, it's an old joke. Where the fucking, you know, the scorpion wants to cross the river and the turtle helps him across and the scorpion stabs him or whatever the fuck. And he's like, what are you doing? I just helped you. And he goes, you know, I was a fucking scorpion. Well, hey, I'm not going to be a scorpion on campus. I'm a scorpion on my fucking show and everybody's getting stung. That's fine. Let's love it first thing. It's a blackout here, folks. You know what I'm talking about? It's big city nights with me. Big, sh- big schmitty nights. That's right. Big schmitty, big schmitty nights. You yeah, keep me right at fucking Klaus Mina in your face. But I, uh, I just was so, I, it just, it just was so, I, I don't want to say, I, I wasn't surprised. I will tell you this. I was not surprised because anytime there's someone who kind of tenuously, if there's even a window of someone who doesn't know who I am or what I do, I know that that window is going to get kicked in. I know. Uh, because he, like I said, he is a guy who's reached out. I think he's actually donated to the show. He's a nice guy. And I, I liked him. All our correspondence has been great. And I think maybe it was his girlfriend who, uh, who took some exception. And look, I, again, do not blame her. I don't blame her because if she doesn't know who I am or what I do, then uh, when you hear me start talking about shoving bomb pops in my ass, then I understand you're going to go, what the fuck? This is the idiot we're going to bring to talk to kids. Uh, But I got news for you. I reach more kids every week than I ever would have in your fucking classroom. Half my demographic is the age of the people in that classroom. The other half is everybody my age. It's the weirdest thing in the world. I hit from zero to 23 and then I hit from 44 up. It's, you know, anybody 24 to 43, not interested, could not be interested in me in the least. Uh, so yeah, so I got whacked. They just, they wrote me and, and, uh, I was, I was fucking, I, you know, I was disappointed because when I, I actually, in my head, I was like, well, this is a new avenue for me. And I was interested and, and thought, well, I could reach people. And then I could also go out there and do a one man and sell some tickets. I was excited. Um, but I also wasn't surprised. I mean, again, like I said, it's if someone doesn't have full confidence in me and what I do and is kind of just being introduced to me, the second they hear me fucking yammer on about bomb pop and Chinese Rick, they're going to go, what the fuck? Uh, which is fine. 
But uh, but I also found it ironic that I was getting bullied off of a symposium about bullying. That seems a little strange. <laughs> You're listening to The 40-Year-Old Boy, and coming up later, Sarah Newton and the Aborigine who won't stop touching himself. Thank you, Tom. Tom Faust, everyone. Can't tell you how excited we are to have you on the team. Anyone out there have a question for Tom? Better ask it now. He leaves for London in the morning. Oh, I see a hand in back. Stand down, germ! Did you say a hand? Rest assured that what you call a hand is a claw! A claw capable of producing a grip strong enough to rip your treasonous lungs out through your soft human belly! I didn't get your name. I did not give it! I am Yeep, servant of Thorgar, the most rancorous of Gehenna's savages! An archfiend whose very gaze will turn your human blood black! Thorgar demands to know why this diseased shit-stained Tom Faust has been chosen for the London position! Thorgar has worked tirelessly for Lombardi Industries, eating the souls of all who have opposed his company's progress, crushing the skulls of rival CEOs in his jaws at the very instant he was inserting his cloven-hooved leg into the malignant vaginas of their women! The synchronized suffering only serving to fuel Thorgar's insatiable bloodlust! Look, we appreciate all of our Appreciation is not enough! Your ceremonial title of employee of the month! While certainly thoughtful, does nothing to quench the vile lord's thirst for the power he so richly deserves! You dare choose Tom Faust over Lord Thorgar, defiler of angels? You show favor to this Faust, who though he carries the name of one in league with Mephistopheles, is nothing more than the cancerous afterbirth resulting from the syphilitic coupling of mere mortals! This is your new head of accounts receivable, London Division! UNACCEPTABLE! I'm starting to think you're not a team player, Yip. That's yeast! Thorgar tires of your impudence! Know that your decision here today impacts not just yourselves, but every past and future member of your decaying lineage! Those with Faust or Lombardi blood are now doomed to an eternity in hell's barren landscape, with unspeakable tortures amplified to ever more horrifying agonies! Their anuses will be constantly overfilled with the vomit of goblins, while their backs will be broken so their mouths can be twisted into position to catch the never-ending runoff. Hell's imps will squawk over their faces, forcing endless diarrhea through their digestive systems like an unholy centrifuge. From this moment on, there will never be a moment when a Faust or Lombardi is not being force-fed from an anus, perhaps even tasting the bit of feces from the blistered colon of Thorgar himself. Consider this the abominable one's two-week notice. Farewell! Um, excuse me, one more thing. Thorgar would like to know if he qualifies for Cobra. Buy some tickets, Kansas City. All right. Uh, <laughs> that's the theme of the show. We should just name the show that. Buy some tickets, Kansas City. <laughs> um, I don't want to cheapen myself with that. Yes, I do. All right. So, shows this weekend. Uh, I leave. I actually leave tonight. Um, I, I'm going to leave Lily's house and go to work for a few hours. And then I have to take a shuttle to Long Beach, folks. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to take a shuttle. It's so funny. I I always think I'm going to save money. I'm saving money here and there. Like I saved money flying out of Long Beach instead of flying out of LA. I saved like 125 bucks. Well, now I'm paying 55 for a shuttle to fucking take me down there. And uh, cause I, it was either that or long-term parking. Long-term parking is 20 bucks a day minimum, right? It's gotta be. So that would have been Wednesday, Thursday. That would have been 80 bucks. And I'm sure they would have found some other way to gouge me because everybody always does. They always, it, it never ceases to amaze me how when you think it's something, it's always more. It's always more. Uh, here's how. Today I checked into my flights. All right. For uh, First of all, I fly American Airlines almost exclusively. I, I really like flying them. Uh, plus I have miles booked up with them. I've gotten free stuff in the past. I, you know, I'm whatever. Uh, and I've used my miles. That's great. I like flying with them. I will fly with United as well. But sometimes you have to fly w- w- the cheapest one. You got to find it other than Southwest, which I'll never fucking fly. So I this time I'm flying on US Air. Um, 
So I booked my U.S. Air flight to Kansas City, you know, a month ago, and I did it via Long Beach. And there's no, because there's no nonstops to Kansas City. There, there are, but they're like six hundred bucks. So I, I have to fly one stop. So I got to fly from like Long Beach to Phoenix, and then Phoenix to Kansas City. Uh, fine, I, I don't give a fuck. I don't want to do it, but I, you know, I checked with Karen beforehand. I go, look, if I do this, can you take me to Long Beach, and uh, you know, and then pick me up on Saturday? She's like, yeah, I got no problem with that. I said, good. Because, uh, you know, it's not like she's doing anything these days. She's not working. She's home. I'm like, good. And and so she helps me. She does nice things. She helps me uh, bag up the Kickstarter stuff. She she does a good job uh, for me. She gets no money for it at all. She gets grief. So good for her. Uh, so she was going to take me to Long Beach and everything was fine. And uh, then I was checking into the plane this week. So um, my wife got a job this weekend. Uh, and I, and it's been, she, my wife hasn't worked in a couple of years. All right. She wanted, uh, there was a whole thing in her other job and I, I'm not going to go into it cause I don't know. I look, I talk too much about my wife on here and I don't think she'd be happy about it. Uh, but suffice to say, she's been looking for a job for a while. So she wound up getting a gig and, uh, it's, it's not a full-time deal. It's like a three month temp gig. Um, but we, we were coming to a point where this kind of had to happen. Like she, you know, she's. She's working really hard to find a job, uh, but it just keeps getting tougher every day. <laughs> so uh, with that tribute to Steve Miller in mind, she, uh, she's been looking and looking, and finally she gets a gig last week. And of course, that gig comes the week before I, she's got to take me to fucking Long Beach. So it's going to cost this money in the long run anyway. You know what I mean? Like it just, it always happens that way. And I'm so happy that she got a gig and she is and she's thrilled. But at the same time, you get that weird selfish pang that just goes, really? Fuck. Now, because now I got to spend 55 bucks to take a shuttle? When, I, here's another thing too. Um, well, the, the fuck. So anyway, I was real happy that she got the gig. And I, But I'm going to say, all right, this is funny. She got the gig through a temp agency. She's been going to called like three or four different temp agencies, working through them. And, uh, she had to go in and meet with the temp agent and they have to, you know, they got to interview and give you a bunch of tests and all sorts of bullshit that I would fucking hate if I lived in the real world. I'm getting there, but right now I don't. Um, so Karen goes in Now this is before she has the job offer from the other company, but she goes in to meet with the temp agency and, uh, they call her after her tests. They call her the very next day and they go, look, we have a job for you, we think. We're just we're waiting to hear from them on the resume. But it just so happened it came in pretty quick and it would be a three-month gig through September or, I don't know, to, to August, June. Yeah, through the end of August. And uh, fingers crossed, they said. And it's like, okay. So they call Karen and they talk to her on the phone and, and Karen's all happy, I can see, and she hangs up. And I'm like, what happened? She goes, well, I got, I got the job. I start Monday at 8 a.m. And I'm, I was so happy. We were so excited. And I, I thought it was so great. And she says, yeah. She goes, uh, so I got to do a bunch of stuff this weekend. You know, I got to get, get my clothes ready. I got to get my suit ready. I got to start going to bed earlier so I can get in the, you know, work on getting up early. I got to dye my hair. I got to go ahead and uh, figure out, maybe, maybe go shopping and grab some, you know, new dresses. And I went, I go, hold on. Why, why do you have to dye your hair? And she goes, oh. She goes, well, um. Because my wife has black, you know, black hair, but she has red streaks in it and not red fire engine, red, crazy streaks, like almost like um, magenta, uh, but not not crazy punk rocker. I don't know how to put it. It's uh, it's just within her hair. It's awesome. It gives it shine. I mean, she's got like regular black hair, but then with these little streaks of red through it. And it looks really nice. And she said, oh, well, uh, I don't want to say the woman's name, but the woman at the temp agency said, uh that it would probably be best if I dyed my hair because it was a little wild for offices. And uh, <laughs> my wife's been looking for work for two years. And she finally finds a job and she's got to dye her hair. And I, I looked at her and I go, fuck them. And she goes, what? And I go, fuck them. Don't dye your hair. She's like, what do you mean? They, they you know, she said that I should dye my hair. I go, I, I don't give a fuck that you need to dye your hair. That's ridiculous. What the fuck does that have to do with your job uh, performance? What the fuck does that have to do with you being able or qualified or capable of doing anything? It doesn't say in your fucking resume, black hair. It doesn't say that. And they didn't hire you because of it. You're not going to work at the black hair factory, are you? <laughs> I mean, did they? let's put it this way. Did they hire you to be a Mexican? Because that's the only way I could see why you would need to have black hair at all times. 
Did they say, hey, we're hiring you to be Chinese? I don't think they did. (laughs) If they were looking to hire a Chinese person or hiring you for the role of Chinese person, then yes, I would imagine you would need a solid head of black hair. But as it is, your hair is not garish. It's not loud. It doesn't take away from the fact that you're doing your job. Your hair looks really nice. Fuck them. Don't dye your hair. Like I, all of the old anti-establishment anti-fucking authority bullshit that's that's still wedged inside me for my whole life bubbled over and she's like i i hear you i understand that but i need a job so i'm dying my hair and i'm like i'm and i was furious it's like literally she's been out of work for two years and 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 not even close to finding a gig not even not even close and the first one that comes along and they tell her to dye her hair, I wanted to firebomb the factory, like the house, the office, whatever the fuck it is. I wanted to go to the temp agency and look at this woman and just go, what the fuck is wrong with you? Who do you think you are to control people that way? You can't tell them to just dye their hair or change who they are. Or that, That's like saying, you know what? You've got to put on like 10 pounds, man. You look thin. I mean, it's just you can't fucking do that. So, uh. So I, I told her, I go, don't dye your hair. Don't. I go, I, I don't give a fuck. What, like, I, I'm willing to go to the mattresses over this. Like, I'm, really, I'm ready to vo- sleep in the fucking street. I'm going to be homeless soon, but I'm ready to do it as long as my wife doesn't. Have, and it's the stupidest thing. It's dumb. I understand. Because I, I, you know, uh, I, I would audition for commercials. And they would go, hey, will you cut your hair? Hey, will you, get a, will you shave your goatee? And, uh, and I would always say, yeah, of course I would. Who, who wouldn't? I mean, that's the dumbest thing in the world. Why for a national commercial would I not shave my goatee? It grows back. It's not like you only get one for your whole fucking life. <laughs> Trust me, it'll come. I have to grow it back because I don't, I want to make sure I'd ward off zombies. As we know, zombies hate goatees. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, did you see that guy? Did you see the, the pictures of the guy after the surgery? He's alive. That guy's alive. The, the guy with the f- eaten face and they're trying to fix him. And oh my God, let me tell you something. There is nobody happier about this than the medical community in fucking Florida or in the world for that for that matter. They're like, because everybody else hears, oh my God, a guy got his face eaten off. I hope that dude dies so he doesn't have to relive that over and over in his fucking brain for the rest of his life. Well, no, you know what they hear? Oh my God, we get to experiment and figure out if we can rebuild a guy's face. Like they're so happy. It's like someone gave, it's like Christmas. Like someone brought them Legos. They're like, yay, look at this homeless Lego set with no face. <laughs> We've got to go ahead and put it together. What's it going to be? To them, the homeless dude, it's just like a puzzle. Like, it's all fucking torn apart. And they're like, we got to put this homeless dude back together again. Fuck you, Oscar Goldman. Let that guy die. You can't rebuild him. He will not be stronger. He will not be faster. He will not fight Bigfoot. And he will not crush a cue ball in his fucking hand. He's not Steve fucking Austin. Let him die. Goddamn medical community always fucking getting up there. Hey, let's go ahead and fix this dude. Fuck that. It's like the woman who got torn apart by chimps. And then she goes on Oprah. She's like, I feel great. No, you don't. Holy shit. You can tell Oprah you feel great. You got kind of a working face now. But at some point in the dark, you're going to be in your house and you're going to see a banana and you're going to lose your fucking mind. (laughs) Chimps ate your face. End it. End it. Find a bridge. God damn it, buy a car and just put a cinder block on the gas pedal and point it at the nearest brick wall. You're fucking finished. Chimps ate your face. You get one face in this life. You lose it, you're done. That's the new rule. You get one face in this lifetime. And if you have it fucking removed, you ruin it in some way, you get the fuck out. Done. Kill yourself, leap off a bridge, jump off a plane, jump in the 40-year-old boy blimp and Hindenburg that shit. Oh, the humanity. Look at your face, it's gone. You don't feel fine because eventually you're going to be sitting there flipping channels and all of a sudden, oh my God, National Geographic's on and look, they're going to talk about how smart and friendly the monkeys are and you're going to lose your fucking mind. (laughs) You think this guy in the hospital now who's getting a rebuilt face ever wants to take a bath again? You know that's happening. He's in the bed and then they're like, hey man, can you want to we want to give you a bath? Ha, 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 ha! Bath salt zombie ate his fucking face off and you ask him if he wants a bath. Way to go, nurse. And then they show his face like they're making progress. They're not. They're not. His face looks like creme brulee. Leave him the fuck alone. No eyes. I mean, here's my favorite part if you see the picture. <laughs> I have to say this. They got the picture of his rebuilt face, and it's it looks like just a it looks like somebody dropped a fucking basket of fried eggs. That's what it's just a mess. It's awful. And it's just they're rebuilding it. And granted, I will say this. 
certainly looks better than it looked before. There's there, that can't be argued, although there was at least the outline of a skull before. But now, as they put him back together and they try to reconstruct him, his face, it just looks like someone took a creme brulee torch and crisped up his face. It's just awful. But here's the best part. If you see the picture, please, please. And I guarantee you, you know what? I don't even need to tell you. I should just say, look at it and tell me the first thing that your eye goes to. That I should t- Well, fuck it. I'm going to tell you. If you go look at the picture, his face is destroyed. I mean, it's gone. They're rebuilding it. They're doing skin grafts, whatever the fuck. And it's like, it's just a mess. And they've got him next to his old picture, like what he used to look like. You know what my favorite part is? They've got two pictures. They've got previous homeless guy and now now no face homeless guy. You know what face they left out? The, the no face guy. They should have. How do you not put that one directly in the center and go, he was like this. And then, holy shit, the zombie ate his face off and he looked like this. But now here, take a look. Fried egg face. Not so bad, right? Compared to eating off face. Because you know what? Putting it up next to what he used to look like, that's not helping. That's not helping anybody at all. Because it's like you need something. You need the contrast in the center there to show why it went. Because you know what? It's not. I'm not solving for X. I'm not solving for X. Give me all of the equation right there in front of me. Normal homeless guy. Homeless guy after zombie attack, bath salt, zombie ate his fucking face off. And then now drop the basket of fried eggs on his head. That's... It's a perfect compliment. You go boom, 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 and now we see the progress. But, but if you just saw what he looked like initially before the zombie ate his face off, and then now what you've done to him, it looks like you fucked him up. I gotta be honest with you. <laughs> but they got the picture, and he's all fucking, he's, it looks like it, it looks like a basket of fried eggs was dropped on his face, or it looks, you know what he looks like? If you ever, what, you ever see those old things where the film strip would get caught on the light bulb, and then it would burn and just fry? That's what his face looks like. It just looks like horribly, it just looks like a mess. All right. But they've got him there and his face is, you know, all deconstructed and, and, uh, you know, in the upper left hand corner of his. I think it's on his left cheekbone. If there does he have a cheekbone left? I have no fucking clue. It's up by the other. It's up by fried egg number six. All right. That's what it looks like. Uh, There's there's a bandage on his face. Like it's it looks like the kind of bandage you would have in a in a like a in a Mike Tyson's punch out when you would get hit and you have like a black guy and then like that X bandage on your face. It almost looks like as a joke they were like, well, this face, you know what? Just throw a bandage on that one part of it. What what are they covering up? That's what I want to know. What the fuck is the bandage covering up? If the rest of that was acceptable for us to see, hey guys, peel that bandage off. No. Oh my God, you want us to clear this room? We take that bandage off. You guys will be so sick to your stomachs. What the fuck could it possibly be? Take the bandage off. Don't don't tease him. You know what? That because you know, he doesn't have any eyes anymore. So they probably went and they pressed that bandage and like, oh, we're just covering up the one horrible thing that's on your face, but the rest of you looks fantastic. Well, how come I can't see? It's very important you keep your eyes closed. Well, it doesn't matter. I can't open them. Yes, because the zombie ate your eyelids. Ah, ah, ah! No, I'm sorry. He didn't really eat your eyelids. I meant to say that you're feeling fine, right? You look good. By the way, we think that for the press conference, we're going to have to dye your hair. Is it okay if we dye your hair? So, so they wanted Karen to dye her hair. And I was so mad. I was so mad. And oh, would you find the picture? I told you. Is there, see the bandage? It's like just like this tiny, hey, hey, cut yourself shaven with a weed whacker? What the fuck happened to your head? Uh, there's no way that guy feels good about himself ever. Honestly, you get one face, and when it's finished, you're finished. Done. Take a goddamn powder. And you know what? I, I'm talking about getting into a car accident or fucking jumping off a, a, a blimp. It looks like that's what happened to him. It looks like the Hindenburg crashed into his face. That's what happened. The Hindenburg was actually going to land, and it crashed right into Homeless Joe's face and burnt the fuck out of him. Meanwhile, this week they did an autopsy on the zombie, and they said he didn't really swallow any of the flesh, so he wasn't like my favorite person. They're they're debunking the zombie theory. <laughs> Come on, I don't give a fuck if he swallowed the flesh. Because I mean, how do you know that zombies swallow the flesh? All we see is them tearing the shit out of it. No one. And they, you ever see? Let's put it this way: Have you ever seen a movie and a zombie went, "Oh, I'm full"? No, you never have. They could just be tearing it off to tear it off. Nobody knows about zombie physiology. All we know about zombies is from fucking George Romero. You see that guy recently? Holy shit. I don't want to take any facts from that dude. So I love that when they're trying to debunk the zombie thing. They're like, hey, look, at least he didn't swallow any of the flesh. Well, no, he just sat there and growled while he tore it off with his mouth. And then they had to shoot him nine times. Empty a fucking clip into his chest. You're not making me feel better about this story. Telling me that he didn't swallow the flesh. Jesus. Oh, Christ. All right. So uh, so what I, I guess my point is don't ever tell my wife to dye her hair ever. I was furious. I don't know why I was so mad about it. You know, and then Karen, she had her first day of work yesterday and she wore a business suit. She wore a nice business suit and she showed up and uh, 
they took her to a side and they were like, okay, we got to move these files. They were, they were like going to have her move boxes and stuff, like some stuff, you know, because you're a temp. They, that's what they do. You sit down and you do a bunch of data entry or do whatever the fuck you do. And then you coordinate some stuff and then you go over and do another thing. And, uh, and it turned out they brought her over to this room and they were like, okay, we got to kind of move these records over here. And, and Karen's in heels. I mean, she's wearing heels in a business suit. And she actually said to the woman, um, do you want me to move this now? Like, I, uh, I, I'm not exactly dressed to do it. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. We can do that tomorrow or, or I can have somebody else do it. And, uh, and which was great. And Karen's like, fine, whatever you need. And Karen got along great with everybody. It was so good. She had a good day. I was so, <laughs> believe me, I was dreading, dreading her coming home yesterday and telling me how awful it was. Like, because I, I mean, you, you never know. You never know what you're getting into. I, I worked temp work. I told you I was a fucking cantaloupe, potato, whatever the fuck you want to call me at one time. Uh, I went and did telemarketing for a temp job. And one time they, I got booked to work into a factory. And I showed up in this factory, and it was like it was like a hundred degrees outside. But then you get in the factory, and they had the you know the air conditioning crank, but it didn't matter. It was still hot because it was like a that corrugated aluminum fucking siding. And uh, they're like, yeah, we just got to. I, I, it was again grunt work. They just we need to move all of this stuff from this side of the factory over to the other side of the factory. That that was it. And so they hired a bunch of temp dudes to do it because this is before they opened Home Depot, and they can go ahead and scoop up a bunch of Mexican dudes to do it. This is back, you know, 20 fucking years ago when they actually cared <laughs> to have some sort of temp agency send over a bunch of fucking bodies and idiots. Of course, we're all actors, you know, oh, well, perhaps I'll act like a lumberjack and carry it that way. Shut up. Move the fucking pile. God damn, that was awful. That was one of the worst days ever when I showed up. Oh, I, just dudes. Look, I don't like work. You know that. I don't like any work. And I feel bad that all of you work. I wish you didn't have to work. Someday I'll win the poor people's stock market and I'll just pay for all of you to come here and just hang out. <laughs> all of you except for some people who bullied me off a symposium but other than that that's fine uh no of course you're invited to as well come on you're we're all invited together for fruit flavored anal rape <laughs> uh so yeah so karen got the gig oh and so uh, uh but that's this fucking chick told she told her to wear a business suit told karen to dye her hair karen shows up it's it's casual wear the whole office is everybody casual, and and she told me she's like, yeah, they said, yeah, you just wear what you want. Like, I I'm, I'm I want to go find that woman and just fucking uh uh huh. Did she dye her hair? She dyed her hair. She dyed her hair Saturday, solid black. Looks good. I mean, you know, her hair always looks nice, but it just it just was such a weird anti individualism thing. Like it just and and unfortunately, you're in a position now. We're in a position now where there's look, there's nothing worse in life to be in a position where you have to do things. Oh my God. There's there. You guys know that. I mean, there's uh, cause there's a thing. If you have a job and you don't like it, Hey, maybe I'll get another job. Well, no um, bills are due and you need to stay there. You have to stay at the job. I've had that speech to me given to me many times where I wanted to just walk the fuck out. And look, I've, uh, you know, I've walked the fuck out anyway, usually, uh, cause I kind of make my own rules and I've just kind of failed. Uh, well, I wouldn't even say failed up. I've failed in a straight line. I haven't gone anywhere in 20 years. <laughs> That's basically what I've done. Um, although I got a phone call today with a lead on a gig and it was so funny. The one, the one guy in town who thinks I'm funny and thinks I like that. I haven't alienated. Uh, he was the guy who produced several shows that I've worked on. And he, I, I believe me when I get up and I see his name on my cell phone, I'm like, Oh, Oh my God. Um, cause I was asleep. I sleep during the day cause I'm a fucking vampire. So I wake up and as I'm leaving my house to come here to Lily's, I see his name on my cell phone and I'm like, Oh my God, please, please be a gig. And, uh, it's the, it's the early stages that they possibly might have a pitch for a gig, that kind of thing. But he wants me involved. So I'm like, yes, done, done. He's like, yeah, we can throw you some money. I go, look, throw me a job. I go, I honestly, I don't give a, you don't have to pay me a fucking thing for the help. I said, uh, just get me a job if we go to series. And he's like, well, you know, obviously right now that you know how it is, that's 80 steps away. But, you know, I, I, I definitely, you're the first name I always think of. And I was like, and it, you know what? It, you're happy to hear that finally sometimes. You know, it's instead of hearing that uh, nobody knows who the fuck you are or nobody's interested in you or nobody wants you here. And you're just like, when you hear that, you're like, yay, that's, oh my God, that's right. I, I did prove to at least one person that I can do this and that I'm funny. Um, but the bad news is if the show goes to series, I have to dye my hair. I am not happy about that, folks. Let me tell you. Uh, but I'll do it. I'll fucking do it. Holy shit, I'll do it. Can Kansas City, you need me to dye my hair? Do you need me to dye my hair for this weekend? Is that what it is? Is that the holdout? I just wish you would have told me if you would have just reached out and said, Mike, we'll fill the jam place if you go ahead and dye your hair. Fuck, do you want me to dye my hair during the show? I could pull that off. Maybe I show up and we do a hair dye party. Let's, uh, we all get together because usually the show's a little longer than it should be. Well, let's let's take that first hour instead of me recapping my trip. Why don't we all just get together and dye my hair? Oh, my God. And Anybody want to braid it? Some of you can braid it because <laughs> it's long. Have I mentioned that it's long? 
Uh, I haven't had a cut in God knows how long. All right, so uh, I was talking about something about Kansas City. Taking the shuttle. That's how I led into Karen. Oh, this too. Fuck. You always think you're okay. So I saved money, like I said, to fly from down there. Now I got to take a shuttle. So that ate a part of it. So uh, U.S. Air. I fly American Airlines because I, I, that's who I like to do business with. Well, folks, um, U.S. Air had the better fare this time and it worked out. So I was like, all right, I'll take them. And uh, I booked my flight and I bought the ticket about a month ago, maybe three, no, a month ago. Yeah, a month ago. And then I sat down to check in today and it said, uh, hey, check in for your flights. Fantastic. I need to get my boarding passes. And uh, it said, here's your first flight from Los Angeles to Phoenix. You are sitting in seat 9A. Uh, 9A is on the left-hand side of the plane. It's a window seat, but still on the left-hand side of the plane. Uh, when I booked it, I booked an F seat. But they changed it because they wanted to, apparently. I, I, I was fucking furious, so I went to the seat map, and uh, there are no window seats left on the right-hand side of the plane, except one that's 15 extra dollars. Because it's in the what they're I don't know if you're familiar with the airlines now, folks. Um, the airlines now are just a big cock headed right for your asshole. That's all they are at all times. They are looking to fuck you everywhere they can. So now exit row used to be, you know, a little extra money because you get to pick the exit rows, more room, whatever the fuck. Well, now they have this thing called priority seating. So if you want to sit in like the first eight rows so you get off the plane sooner, they will charge you for the privilege. It also works where they do it on the planes in South, you know, the Border Bank Airport because they open the back doors. They will charge you extra for the back rows because you get to get off the plane sooner. I don't know who the fuck's in that much of a hurry that they're going to pay to get off the plane sooner. I, I, rich people. That's who the fuck it is because rich people, their time doesn't matter. And fuck, as I've said, I'm not even rich and my time matters. If I if I go to a fucking toll booth and it's uh, it's 80 cents, OK, and I'm driving through and I, I only have quarters I will not sit in the exact change line and get back my 15 cents. I will go through the fast one. I'll throw the dollar in and get the fuck out. Keep my 15 cents, Illinois. I don't care. Enjoy it. Because my time is worth more than that. If they change stamps, if I have like a 41 cent stamp and they change it to 43, I will not stand in line for the two cent fucking stamps. I will put two 41 cent stamps on my letter and hope it gets there that much sooner. That's what I will do. Because my time is fucking valuable, folks. But it's not that valuable that I need to hustle off a fucking plane because I want to murder those fucking people all the time. Plane lands, I sit there. I sit there with my earbuds on and I laugh at everybody who stands up and waits and waits and waits as we taxi, waits and waits and waits at the gate. They can't get the fuck out. They're waiting. And they, why are you? I mean, I guess you're standing up because you've been sitting for fucking five hours in the sky. That's I get that part if you want to stretch out. But the people who think they're going to get off the plane sooner or faster, the people who turn on their, uh, their fucking cell phone right away and go, I'm at the gate, I'm, I'm getting off the plane now. No, you're not. You're not. Sit the fuck down look at this teeming mass of humanity that's in front of you unless you take some bath salts and eat your way out of here you're not getting off this fucking plane that fast motherfucker so i i don't i don't care but sure enough i have to sit on the right hand side of the plane i know you think i'm stupid but especially today here's why because uh today i've been trying to adjust my schedule so i can work out OK, so I'm trying to go to bed at an earlier time and wake up at an earlier time. But the thing is, it's hot now in Los Angeles. So if I go to bed at 630 or 7 o'clock a.m., I'm getting up at one o'clock in the afternoon and then I'm up all day and then I have to work all night graveyard. And then I come home and I go back to bed at seven. So it's uh, it's kind of a weird process. Well, today I went to bed right when I got home. I, got to, I went to bed at 630 and then I woke up at fucking noon and it's hot and I'm not going to get back to sleep. I actually tried to, and then I got up at 1230 and went, well, fuck it. I had to because I knew I had to be here at Lily's at four. So I just got up uh, and I was supposed to do some mailing shit, Kickstarter stuff. Hey, it's not coming yet, folks. I apologize, uh, but it will be. It'll be coming when I get back from Kansas City and whatever. So I'm awake and then I have to come here and then I have to go from here home and pack. And then I have to work tonight because I can't exactly give away any cash these days. So I have to work and then I have to be home by 3 a.m. to meet the shuttle. And then the shuttle will take me to Long Beach. And then I will get on the plane and I will fucking zonk out and sleep. But I need to have the right seat to sleep because uh, when I get to Kansas City, well, all right, let's take this. I apologize. That's the flight to Phoenix. Uh, so then I had to check in for the flight from Phoenix to Kansas City. And uh, I was in fl seat E, uh, which is a middle seat, folks. They had put me in a middle seat somehow. I had bought an F seat, but somehow I was in a middle seat. And luckily there was like, six window seats on the right hand side of the plane so i was able to switch out and get a window seat uh so i was happy i was up early to check in but i was infuriated I, I american doesn't do that to me other places have juggled me before and american has when i've been at the airport tried to move me to get a family to sit together and i basically told them to fuck off but uh 
but I need these seats so I can sleep on this trip because once I get to Kansas City, uh, our friend Scott, who started the Kansas City page, is picking me up at the airport and he's taking me to some barbecue place and then he's taking me to the Royals game. So it's not like I can even go home and take a nap. Like once I get to Kansas City, I am I am knee deep in the fucking Missouri hoopla, folks. Uh, so I need to sleep on the plane. So now, so I had to pay that extra fifteen bucks. And I should tell you this too. Uh, well, I'll just tell you. Um, <laughs> we know the never-ending T-shirt saga that I have. Well, I ordered shirts, and I wanted to have them in time for uh, Kansas City. That's not happening. So I'm not bringing any shirts with me to Kansas City, which sucks. I would love the opportunity for you to not only see them but have the opportunity to purchase them from me. But uh, the reason that I, it's kind of okay is it means I don't have to bring a big bag. I don't have to check a bag so I can carry my own stuff on. So it saves me 25 bucks, right? No, it doesn't. I had to pay the 15 to fucking get on the goddamn plane and 55 for a shuttle. It, does, it never ends. It never fucking ends is my point, folks. You will always pay. You will always pay. Everybody owes. Everybody pays. I've said it all along. Uh, actually, I didn't say it. I took it from a movie. But so what? It's a philosophy I live by and take that. <laughs> I don't know why, why am I throwing it in your face like that. Nobody cares. Uh... So, yeah, so I, uh, that's my flight. What the fuck? Why was I even talking about that? I don't even fucking remember. Uh, wasn't there a point? Flights, money, shuttle, flying, Kansas City. Buy tickets. That's what the point is. <laughs> buy some fucking, you hear the money I'm coughing up? I got to spend all this goddamn money because pay, buy some tickets. If only I hadn't offended the committee. I'd have so much money in my future. Oh my God, so much money would be coming my way. Maybe that's it. Do you want me to dye my hair? Is that what you guys wanted me to do? Do you want me to dye my hair, committee? I'll do it. I'll fucking do it. Bully me into dyeing my hair. Put me back in that symposium. It'll be fantastic. I'll say yes, I'm and no, ma'am. Actually, this is the story I'll tell. I'll tell. This will be the story I'll tell. The story of when I got bullied off of the symposium. That's what I'll tell to the kids who are getting bullied. I'll say, look, I'm here. It gets better. <laughs> I got a built-in bullying story. I can, you handed me you've on a silver platter. You've cer- certainly whacked me in the head with that fucking silver platter. But so what? You handed me a bullying story that I can share with those people right on a silver platter. The shadowy committee, who is not only a panel of symposium deniers, but also a fantastic rock band from the 60s. <laughs> it was the Dave Clark Five and the Strawberry Alarm Clock and the Shadowy Committee. You don't remember that triple bill? Oh, my God. They came over here on a ferry across the Mersey. (laughs) Yep. I like being dumb. (laughs) Speaking of music, folks, speaking of bands, look at my Hold on. I'm slicking back my hair, even though I don't have to. Like, I'm just, I'm taking my hand. I'm like pushing it back, but it hasn't moved. My hair hasn't moved for fuck's sake. And I, I just, and I don't like it. It's like, I don't like it too slicked back. I want it to have like volume and feel to it. And I want it to fall. That's the whole point is it should fall instead of looking. Cause I mean, it, it does get to be very, a little Gene Simmonsy if it just sits on top of my head. Uh, although it's slicked back. If it was dry and like just sat like that, holy, then I look like I have a fucking coonskin cap on. Then, it, then it's total Gene Simmons, which is okay. Cause maybe then his, his daughter will realize that I'm the man for her. Uh, what's her name? Sophie, Sophie Simmons. Oh boy. Sophie Tweed. I don't know. I think she's nine, but Jesus Christ, is she gorgeous? It's terrible. I mean, she's not really nine; she's eighteen, I think. But I mean, the the point is, when that show started on the Family Jewels, she was like fifteen, and I remember she walked in the room, and I was like, "What? The, that's wrong. That's bad. <laughs> that's that can't be good for anybody. It's not good for me or Gene. I, both of his kids are crazy gorgeous. I talked about it in here. His, his son, it looks like Val Kilmer fucked Warren Beatty. I mean, it's like I don't know. Uh, there's something about horrible Gene Simmons jeans mixed up with amazing Shannon Tweed jeans that made this amazing looking child. Oh my God, the kid is so gorgeous. Uh, and then it turned out he's a douchebag like his dad because he stole like a comic book idea i was like really that really happened why are you stealing anything i mean you you you're you you're rich you're fucking now you're in the stupid tv show and he's like you know 610 and gorgeous i mean go model or do something don't be stealing fucking comic book ideas you dick all right nick come on nick <laughs> is that show even still on the air are they still following gene simmons around and watching him trip and fall what the fuck is going on with his life i mean he just because they're on the road now with motley Crue. i just saw him this weekend all right i'll tell you all right let me get into that speaking of music because i was going to talk about music um i went to van halen this past weekend i saw them saturday night at the staples center in los angeles and uh, gene simmons was there because i was in the crowd and uh out of nowhere I, people start cheering 
All right. Well, uh, uh, let me start from the beginning. <laughs> when I was a child in 1978, I discovered Van Halen. So uh, Van Halen is my favorite band. You know that they're there. If I was going to be on a desert island somewhere, I would uh, I would first of all, I have to make sure that a committee approved it because I, it, I can't <laughs> apparently do anything without the shadowy committee going ahead and giving it's OK. Uh, I would want to have my existence on the desert island yanked down from underneath me as other shows have been in the past. Why do I think I'm doing a show on this desert island? I'm going to live there. And the whole point was if I had to be on a desert island. And by the way, if you ever have to be on a desert island, I've never understood the, the process. Like, are you are, are you every time taking a cruise bringing all of the music you love? Or it's just it's just such a silly thing. It makes no sense. Why don't you just say, what is your favorite music? Right? What is your favorite music? Why do I have to add a desert island construct into this? I don't need to have I don't need to have the uh, the element of being alone for the rest of my life to like this music. Is that okay with you? I don't have to be talking to a volleyball to enjoy Van Halen. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh i'm that's right i'm furious at this bullshit construct of desert island discs go to hell i like music wherever i am i don't need sand to enjoy fucking guns and roses uh pearl jam does not go better with me climbing a tree and grabbing coconuts no i tell you and don't and don't kid yourself i would go up a tree like a goddamn monkey i would climb up i would scurry like a monkey up that tree grab the coconuts and then i would leap off and rip off a woman's face and make her happy that she's alive <laughs> I look great. No, you don't. All right. That's going to be horrible for her. Any monkey related business at all. She's got to be thrown. She hears Skid Row saying monkey business. She goes off of a fucking deep end. She sees a Curious George book. Curious George, who has hurt nobody in his life. He's so gentle. He's friends with the man with the yellow hat. Even she sees even him as a threat because she knows what the, the, the uh, what monkeys can do. If anything, she's probably trying to find a phone number for the man in the yellow hat so she can possibly warn him of the dangers of Curious George. Don't piss that monkey off. He looks cute because you got him in clothes and you put him in a human bed, but eventually he's going to rip every piece of skin off your goddamn face and then you're going to have to talk to Oprah and pretend that you like your life. She's finally getting assimilated. She sits down in her house to relax. Turns on the television. There's every which way but loose. And it's Clint Eastwood with an orangutan. She's furious. You can't even say monkey and around around that woman because to her it means something completely different. <laughs> oh, Jesus. She's got a completely different uh, working knowledge of what monkey business means. <laughs> to her well you know what to your kid to your child the monkey bars are where you go on the playground and climb on to her monkey bars are a system of defense that she now has placed in her home just in case the monkeys come back to finish the job <laughs> god damn it so I saw Van Halen last weekend and uh <laughs> I was planning on going, but I wasn't planning on going. Uh, they were here June 1st, and I was in Boston. And then I knew they had two other dates coming up, June 9th in, uh, here back in Los Angeles and June 12th, which happens to be tonight in Anaheim. And uh, Pat Francis, my good friend, Pat Francis, was trying to get tickets for free because he was going to review their show for a website. And uh, he's been doing a lot of that. He gets a lot of, uh, you know, uh, albums and things. He works a lot with the record companies. He's able to review their stuff. It's kind of cool. So he's like, dude, if I get Van Halen tickets, we're going. I said, great. But he and Jimmy were supposed to go to one of the shows in L.A. They were going to go on the first. And I couldn't go because I was heading to Boston. And then it turned out that Pat didn't go for some reason. I don't know what happened. But then Pat contacted me. He's like, dude, you want to go on the 12th? And I, I said, yes, because I, I mean, how am I going to pass up seeing Van Halen? Uh, but then I wasn't sure about the 9th. I'm like, well, if I'm going on the 12th, should I go on the 9th if we get free tickets? And I go, well, fuck this. Go see them twice. Why wouldn't you see Van Halen twice? It makes sense. But I didn't want to buy tickets because tickets are outrageous for Van Halen. I, they just... They're on tour uh, supporting the new album, which is fantastic. And the, the new album, I cannot stress enough to you how much I enjoy it and how good it is. You should get it. Um, but that said, they have priced their tour in a way where they're this once in a lifetime event. I mean, I, I, the tickets on the floor were 140 bucks. Uh, the cheapest tickets in the building, I think, were 70, which was, were up top. Or they, they might have been 45, 
But those are gone immediately because every deadbeat hobo in the fucking city goes ahead and buys those seats immediately. Uh, and then all the ticket brokers buy up the seats on the floor. And in the, it's just it's just a hassle because then the $140 ticket that you thought you were going to get is now 190 or 220 on Craigslist or on StubHub. And I kept looking for the prices to go down and they weren't going down. And I was fucking furious I'm like, because I can't because Karen and I were going to go. All right. But truth be told, w- neither of us should go. I, I really I shouldn't be able to pay for that ticket i i can't i can't afford to go but my philosophy as you've heard is uh nobody dies going thank god my visa bills paid off (laughs) people die going man i'm so happy i saw van halen three times that week (laughs) so uh so the first part of this strategy that i had was i had to break it to my wife that she probably wasn't going to go see van halen um and i so i said to her and she was cool with it uh, so I didn't even have to go to my arsenal of, hey, remember when you saw Prince five times without me? I didn't even have to do that because uh, she did. She went and saw Prince like three times without me and twice with me. She saw him five times in a week. Uh, Prince doesn't have he, uh, Prince has mirrors all over his home. He doesn't see himself five times in a week. So uh, so I, I had that locked and loaded, but I had to break to her. Look, I, you know what? I might. Van Halen is my favorite band of all time, and I might have to go by myself to this. And, and she was very cool with it. She was like, OK, that's fine. Um. But in reality, I knew in my head that I shouldn't go anyway. But again, as I've said, nobody dies thrilled that they're out of debt. So uh, I made the decision where I'm like, well, I got to buy tickets for uh, the, the ninth, but I have to wait and see if they go down. So I looked all week. They weren't going down. They weren't going down. They weren't going down. Friday, I went and, uh, and I saw a little movement. Actually, I saw some tickets getting sold, which is a little freaky, but I don't know if they're being sold or just taken off StubHub. Uh, and I, I pondered it all day Friday, and I kept going and visiting. I kept looking at Craigslist, and people weren't getting the message. But I, I could see that there were a lot of tickets for sale, but people weren't getting the message that they weren't going to unload them because people were still, you could see they didn't want to go too low. Like There were people who were asking me like for $200 a ticket. And then they went down to like 160 a ticket. And then they went down to face value. Hey, these are face value, only 140. Well, the whole point is none of us wanted to buy them at fucking 140. That's still too much. You scooped them up thinking you were going to gouge us. So fuck you. We're going to wait you out. Uh, I speak for the royal we, by the way, of all the people who are going to buy Van Halen tickets. Uh, I've elected myself their king, their spokesperson. Uh, I spoke at their symposium last week. So we are waiting and waiting. And all night long, I was up all night Friday and I kept going to Craigslist. I kept going to StubHub and looking. And then finally Saturday morning came and the show was that night. And in my head, I was still debating whether to spend the money. And I didn't know if I could go and I wasn't sure if I could pay the cash. And I told Karen that she's like, you should just go. It's fine. And I go, yeah, but I'm not finding any real good prices for tickets. And so I went on StubHub. And like I said, because here's the thing, there were tickets upstairs on StubHub, Uh, StubHub, 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 completely different. Uh, I actually spent a couple hours there and I picked up a meatball sandwich and a grinder um, and a turkey and avocado. By the way, can we firebomb Subway for those commercials where the humans have child voices? What the fuck are they thinking? I don't get it. I don't understand it. And now there's a there's a commercial now like at a fire station where there's a guy looking for his sub and there's a, a the chief is black and they got a black little kid to speak, you know, you know, for the the chief, because they were like, "Well, we need a black guy, obviously, to match the black guy." And then the little kid, but he, it's racist, not really racist, but they made him talk like, "Hey, yo, what, how you do?" Like they made him talk like a black guy. Like I can almost picture them coaching some eight year old talk more black. I mean, it's just terrible. And maybe that's incumbent on me to not think that he sounds black. You know what I mean? Maybe maybe Subway's not the problem here. Maybe I'm the problem here. And I'd like to thank you all for coming to the symposium on bullying and racism. So. <laughs> <laughs> Look, folks, I, black and white, doesn't matter. I cut you, you cut me. We both bleed red. And then they have to do skin grafts on our arms and it looks like somebody dumped a bucket of fried eggs on us. <laughs> Stop cutting each other is my point. That's the message I bring to you folks at this fine university. Stop cutting one another. <laughs> to the bar. So Saturday I'm looking and now it's like 11 o'clock. It's noon. I'm looking for tickets. Uh, and on Craigslist, finally tickets are, they're starting to go way down. There was a guy who wanted 140. Then I saw it overnight. I saw it go to 120. I saw it go to hundred a ticket, but they were on Dave's side. I didn't want to buy tickets upstairs because the Staples center is, uh, it's a nosebleed because they have, you know, they have the regular floor and then the bowls, but then they have these, these stacks of suites, luxury suites that make the balcony super high. So I've gone, like I went to see the Eagles and sat way up high and I've seen the Bulls games from, and you just, you get a nosebleed. Like it really is almost like vertigo where you, you can't be up there that long. Uh, if I'm going to sit in that balcony area, I have to sit in the first row because the other stuff is just too high. 
So I wasn't going to buy those. And the first row, of course, they still wanted 150 for first row balcony. I'm like, you're fucking joking, right? It's still balcony. And you paid 50 bucks for that fucking seat. So choke on it. You get that attitude, too, where it's like, I, to, to spite people, I almost won't go see Van Halen because I don't want to pay for the fucking ridiculous ticket. Um, but then um, in the past few weeks, they've been touring. Things have been going well, and I've been very excited to see them. As you know, I've talked about it. I've seen clips on YouTube, and, I'm, and they've been adding new songs every night and, uh, and really changing the set list and playing old deep cuts, which is what I want to see. I don't, I don't give a shit if I ever hear You Really Got Me from Van Halen again. I don't ever have to hear Running With The Devil again. Uh, there's certain songs that have just been played out, even for me, with Van Halen. Uh, but if they want to play Light Up The Sky off fucking Van Halen 2, oh my God, I'll pay double the ticket price. I'm fine. If I, dude, if, if they play all deep cuts, I'll go crazy. If you want to play Feel Your Love Tonight off the first album, Jesus Christ, they'll go crazy. If you want to play, uh, you know, fucking Dirty Movies, oh Jesus, if they play Dirty Movies off Fair Warning, oh, I, I'd leap off the balcony to my death just when finished, just so I died at a, the high point of my life. So, uh, so that's the thing is I, in my head, I'm, I'm watching the YouTube clips and they're changing the set list and they're monkeying with it a bit. Oh my God. Sorry, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh. Um, so they're, so they're changing it up and I'm so excited. And I see some clips on YouTube and, uh, and I'm, I really want to go. So I'm excited that the tour is going well, but then they announced like all these new shows. And I think I mentioned on here, a guy in Indianapolis offered to take me. After my Indianapolis show, he wanted to drive to Cleveland. He was going to get tickets and drive uh, our friend David. He said, I'll take you to Van Halen the next night. And then uh, another person wanted me to come to Milwaukee and do a show. Uh, I think it was Jill. Our friend Jill wanted me to come to Milwaukee. She's like, yeah, we'll take you to that show. I'm like, Jesus, okay. And then Van Halen apparently got wind of these plans and canceled the entire leg of the tour. And when they canceled these 30 dates, it was, you know, they announced these dates later. They, this is the first leg of the tour that they're still on now. And then they added to 30 dates about a month and a half ago. Well, then two weeks later, they canceled all the dates abruptly. And everybody's like, oh, my God, why are they canceling dates? And, of course, everybody speculates that they want to kill one another. Eddie hates Dave. Dave hates Eddie. Alex hates Dave. Wolf hates all of them. No one knows what's going on. Uh, but what it turns out is they're probably having trouble selling tickets. And I don't think it's a referendum on their popularity. I think there's a lot of people out there who still want to go and see Van Halen. I just think there's a lot of people out there who don't want to pay 150 fucking dollars to go see Van Halen. And it's borne out because they canceled these dates. And I guess in Oakland, they wound up having to do a two for one ticket special through Ticketmaster the week before the show. Because otherwise you've got huge blocks of seats that are going to be empty. And it, you know, because Oakland is a, I don't know that, I guess it's a good Van Halen market. They taped there a long time ago, but you have to think about it, especially like I was su surprised they were playing Staples Center on the the first and then going up to play San Jose and stuff in Oakland and then coming back and playing here on the ninth. That shows me that they don't think they can sell out two nights in a row. Uh, whatever. It's all logistics and bullshit. And I don't I don't give a fuck. All right. I want them to make as much money as they possibly can and good for them. But at the same time, I'd still like to be able to see them. Uh, and I don't want them to price themselves out of my range. But I'm but at the same time. I, I may never see them again. I mean, this is, you know, it's my favorite band of all time and they may never tour again because as we've all heard, uh, Alex hates Dave, Dave hates Eddie, Eddie hates Dave, Wolf hates all of them. I think I've covered that right now. So I was trying to justify in my head paying the price and then in my head, once they canceled those other 30 dates, I went, that's it. I have to go because maybe they're not getting along. Maybe, who knows? I don't know what's going on in the camp, but I have to fucking go see them on the 9th. But then when I sat there and pondered and I stared at the money and I looked at StubHub and I looked at Craigslist and I couldn't find tickets, I saw them dropping but not dropping enough, even though I was going alone. Uh, and then I'm factoring in like, well, I got to drive. It's 25 bucks if I park. And, you know, just it's all it's a thing. It's a process. You know that as we get older and there's things that we want to do, you got to fucking figure out the cash. Uh, when I was a kid, fuck, you just waited in line. You got concert tickets and you went to the show because you didn't give a fuck. But now, unfortunately, the guys at, uh, you know, the electric company, uh, and I don't mean the television show, want their money and direct TV and everybody else who was waiting in line with their fucking hand out. So uh, it got to be noon. It got to be one o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday. I still hadn't gone to bed. And if I'm going to the show, I got to be up by five because I got to get ready to go to the Staples Center. So. I finally went on and I went on StubHub and I'm looking around. And all the tickets are there. Are, uh, they're dwindling. People are either taking them down or they're being sold. And then I notice um, I wanted to sit on Eddie's side of the stage. And uh, so I looked on that side and there were certain seats that were like 160 bucks. Because another thing on StubHub, if you want to buy quantity of one ticket, 
you're fucked because you can't choose from all the stuff that's on there. There's only a few people selling one ticket. So there was one ticket that was 160 bucks, another ticket that was like 155. Then I got over on Osai. There's the premier level, and it was right on Eddie's side of the stage. And uh, some people wanted $100, $125, and then there were seats for $55. And then there was a seat for 50 bucks in the 12th row, 55 in the 9th row. And it was right on Eddie's side of the stage, just two levels up. So I looked at it, and I'm like, holy shit. And I looked at the view. I went to like Seat Guru. Well, no, Seat Guru is flying. Seat Maps, whatever the fuck. There's some site you can go to, and it gives you sight lines in every arena, and you can see exactly what it looks like from the seat. So I went, and I found the staples. And I'm, I mean, you're looking right down on the stage. It was, it, they were fantastic seats, especially for, originally they were 145 bucks, but now they were, I could have got it for 55. So I'm like, well, fuck, that's the seat I got to get, right? But then uh, I noticed there was another section that had seats available for one ticket and it was uh, floor three, which is the floor section directly in front of Eddie Van Halen. And so I'm like, well, I wonder what tickets they have there. So I click down and, uh, Seat one, row one, floor three, directly in front of Eddie Van Halen. So this is first floor, main floor, first row, first seat, directly in front of the stage. $455. So... I was deciding all night whether I should spend the money to go. But now I figure, well, if I'm going to spend the money to go, <gasps> should I really spend the money to go? Because how amazing is that story? All right. In my head, because I even said I'm validating it this way. I'm like, well, I got to go because I want to go. But also I'll, it, it's a story for the show. But how amazing does the story become if I sit in the first row? If I sit in front row right in front of fucking Eddie? Holy God. Uh... So I click on it, and then with the StubHub fees and everything, it's over 500 bucks. Because uh, I think they take like 4% or something. Whatever, it came out to like $489, I think. And I'm just staring at it. I had it in the queue, I had it all queued up, I'm staring at it. And I'm just going, in my head I'm going, dude, it's, you never would ever get to do this again. You'll never get to do this again. Once in a lifetime, front row, sitting there. And then in my head I'm going, it's a car payment dude it's more than a car payment it's actually more than my car payment to buy that ticket but how amazing is the story <laughs> to sit in the first row at van halen I, I mean just to go and see that and be there i mean i i just it has to be done right it has to be done so i call karen over i go check this out i said look she goes what's that i go look at that I go, you see where that seat is she said, floor three. I go, yeah, but look at this. She goes, row one, seat one. She goes, where's floor three? And I showed her on the map. I go, I go, that's right in front of Eddie. She goes, oh. I go, but I can't do that, right? Because I wanted her to say, yes, I could do that. Because that's what you do when you're married. <laughs> you pretend that you're not going to do something, hoping that the other person will go, no, it's okay to do that. And then you do it. And then they get furious. But in that moment, it's okay. So I went, I can't do that, right? And she looked at me and she put her hands on either side of my face, like on my cheeks. And she goes, happy birthday. Aww. I went, what? She goes, happy birthday. She goes, if you get those tickets, that's, that's your birthday present right there. If you take that ticket. And I went, and it was so funny because you would think normally I would do a somersault and leap up and high five her and then go crazy. And then I would immediately buy the ticket. But the second she said it, just, you know what, just the fact that she approved it, that she said it was okay. That was more than enough for me. Like I, I, cause I know, look, I know I should not buy that fucking ticket for $500. There's no way it's stupid to be in the building for $500. Fuck. I could buy the $50 ticket and then sneak down there somehow. <laughs> I can't pay $500 to enter a building. It doesn't make any sense. Unless they're offering fruit flavored anal rape, then, or frozen fruit anal rape, or whatever the fuck it was called, um, then I'm in. Uh, but just the fact that she said yes and happy birthday, for some reason it brought me back to earth. 
And I went, dude, you selfish cocksucker. You can't buy that ticket. That's ridiculous. Uh, just go to the show. Go to the show. So I went and I go, I go, I can't do that. I can't do that. And she goes, what? Happy birthday. It's fine. It'll be good. And I go, you know the situation. I can't pay for that ticket. I go, you know why? Because I couldn't look you in the face in two weeks when you wanted something and I had to say no. And she's like, yeah, okay. Well, I'm just telling you, though, I, I won't be mad about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trust me. That's a bigger than lie than, than happy birthday. Um, so, uh, and I don't blame her. I don't fucking blame her. If I, if you know what, if your husband paid $500 for something and then a week later he bitched at you for going to the dollar store or buying a fucking shitty guitar, wouldn't you think he was insane? You'd fucking hate him. So I'm hated enough. I don't need to be hated by her. So I'm like, all right, I can't do it. So, uh, I showed her the other seats. She goes, those look good. And she was right. They were absolutely, there was nothing. They're on the premier level. They're perfect. And so I did. I bought, I bought one ticket. I bought a ticket for the premier level, 55 bucks, 64 with tax. A $145 seat before fees I got for $64 flat. And uh, I said, all right, well, I'm going to bed. And uh, she says, okay, when do you got to leave? And I said, well, you know, it's 25 bucks to park too. I got to factor in that. She goes, well, do you want me to drive you down there? I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, I'll drive you down and drop you off and then pick you up. Because she was going to dinner with her friend. I said, well, that, yeah, that'd be cool, but. What time's your dinner? She goes, well, I'll call him and I'll just change it. I'll bring you down at a certain time and then I'll come pick you up. Uh, so it was perfect. She, she's like, I'll take you down. I went to bed. She woke me up and she drove me to the Staples Center. And she dropped me off. And it was very, you know what, who, you know who I was? I was William Miller from Almost Famous. <laughs> Frances McDormand dropped me off to the point where this is true. She dropped me off at the corner of at the, uh, uh, Figueroa and whatever the fuck, right, right, by, right by the Staples Center. She dropped me off. And I got out and there was a bunch of people at the crosswalk and we were all crossing. And she looked at me and she waved. And I said, don't take drugs. And she yelled from the car. She goes, don't take drugs. Because that's the fucking scene in the movie. And everybody laughed and everybody had a good time. And we all gloriously uh, hugged. And then we made it way across and I was alone. Uh, and then stupid me, I went to scalpers looking to find a seat down on floor three because I was like, well, you know, it was only 64 bucks to walk into the building. If I can find another seat for like 60 bucks, that's down in front of Eddie, then that'll work out perfect. Uh, and I went to a few scalpers and the scalpers also did not get the message that, uh, people weren't buying these tickets because they were asking for face value. And I just laughed. I would laugh and walk away and everybody did. And, uh, I, I think these guys ate a ton of tickets or they just gave them away. Or obviously they sell them once Van Halen goes on stage because that's when all the prices completely drop. Um, so I went in, uh, to Staples Center. I walked I, and Premier is great because you don't have to walk with the grade unwashed through the concourse. You get to go through this VIP entrance and you walk up through this purple you know, it's right by the San Marino club. It's a, you know, and then there's all the suite entrances and you walk through this private hallway to your seat. It's amazing. I, we had these seats once for Rod Stewart. It's just, it's just great because the building's fucking fantastic. Uh, and I found my seat and there were people in my seats, of course. And I was just, so I just went cause there was an empty row. I sat in that and watched cool in the gang, uh, tear it up. I, I guess that's the phrase I would use. <laughs> They were cool in the gang. What did you expect? I mean, it's like, you know, it was funny that Dave brought them on the tour and everybody first when they announced it, everybody's like, what the fuck? Why is cool in the gang there? Well, cool in the gang actually did very well and the crowd was into it because it was smart. If you'd have brought some young band that people don't know, people would have been like, get the fuck off the stage. We're waiting for Van Halen. If you would have brought somebody who does the same style of music as you, you would have inevitably been comparing yourselves to them and them to you. So they would have been just basically going through the motions till people went to Van Halen. But to bring cool in the gang, which is so different from Van Halen, it completely made sense. It didn't at first, but then when you think about it, everybody knew all of their songs. They played fucking, you know, Misled and Jungle Boogie and, and every, they played everything. And, and then, of course, closed with Celebration and everybody was all it's, all, it's a room full of fucking white people, so they're going crazy at Celebration. I didn't, I personally just got up and I continued to wander around the halls of the Staples Center trying to congratulate the bride and groom. That's what I did when they played Celebration. <laughs> Uh, but it didn't matter. They were all, you know, they, they were a band. They were all dressed in white in a horn section and having a good time. And, and, uh, well, we're going to have a good time tonight. That's what they kept saying. And I said, all right, I'm going to finally believe it. And then they finished. It was great. They played a fucking, you know, I, I think an hour, 55 minutes and then bailed. And, and, and like I said, you knew every one of their songs, but you weren't waiting for Van Halen. It was good. It was a, a, a smart choice. It turned out to be. So then uh, I sat there and I, I knew from some people that Van Halen, there was no fanfare. The Van Halen just came on stage. Uh, Dave Mech saw them in Chicago. And uh, I will say this. It's funny. They were tearing down the Cool in the Gang stage and then building the Van Halen stage, which was, didn't they had the video screen and then just their instruments. They didn't have the wall of marshals anymore. They had a, a bunch of amps, but uh, they put out a dance floor for Dave. 
like a, there's this section of parquet wood floor where he's going to be the whole time and he does these spins and pirouettes so they shine the floor up I, I, the the floor was as slippery as the top of my head is right now. I mean, it was just shiny, and uh, there was I even filmed the guy. It made me laugh because there was three dudes with towels just buffing the wood. For and boy, I'll tell you what: if you go to a concert, there's three guys buffing the wood. You know, you're having a good time. <laughs> Actually, Lily wanted me to get that weight on Kickstarter. Uh, I'd be wanting to buff in the wood. Um, but these three dudes with towels were just every inch. They were just buffing, and there was one dude with a swiffer. And this dude with the Swiffer just swift all around Dave's uh, parquet floor. That's all he did. He just swift walked in circles. I filmed him. I'm like, boy, if you're Van Halen Swiffer, that says a lot about your career choices. Uh, but he was on stage. He was closer now. He didn't have to pay five hundred dollars to get that close to the stage. They're paying him to swift for fuck's sake. Uh, so he's swiffing. The other guys are buffing. There's buffing and swiffing. Uh, who actually? I, I wish they would have opened the show, but they didn't. Uh, they were they were on the road with the Dave Clark Five and the Shady Committee. <laughs> Buffing and swiffing. Uh, comedians from England. So, waiting for the show to start. Building starts filling up. And it's, it's basically full. And then uh, I hear cheering from down on the main floor, and there's Gene Simmons. I can see him with Shannon Tweed. And it's so funny. He was on the main floor. I wasn't far away, but I was far enough away to where I wouldn't know an individual guy, except I knew fucking Gene Simmons the second I saw him. I knew it. And he walked out and people started cheering as, as he walked down, people were cheering and yelling his name and going crazy. Like as if the band themselves had taken the stage, it was wild. And, uh, and he walked through and I, what I Twittered was, uh, I said, people going crazy as Gene Simmons walks through, uh, he sheepishly smiled, embarrassed and waved. And then in parentheses, I wrote, that's the funniest thing I've ever wrote and written in my life because he was not embarrassed or sheepish in the least. He acted like he acted like he expected it. Like they should be. Of course. Yeah, I'm fucking Gene Simmons. Of course you're cheering for me. I'm in the fucking room right now. He is just so regal. And, and, and we make fun of him. I call him a douchebag and all these different things, but I fucking love him. I love him because he's such an arrogant cock and he doesn't he, he doesn't care. And he's proved it. He doesn't have to be anything other than an arrogant cock because he he made it he made it and he proved it and he's been around for 40 fucking years he put on clown makeup and sang rock music with with, with words like i'm gonna you know let me put my log in your fireplace that's an actual lo- song lyric from a kiss song let me put my log in your fireplace they had an album called Love Gun. I mean, Jesus, he says call me Dr. Love. That's who they are. And yet, he's built an empire. An empire. So he can be where the fuck he wants to be. Can I make fun of him? Yes. Is he ridiculous? Of course. Does he have a goddamn uh, uh, ocelot sleeping on his head? Yes, he does. So what? He's earned the fucking right. Did he make a sex tape with his socks on? Yes, he did. Awful, awful move. Actually, almost that was the thing that almost toppled him from his his pinnacle of cool. That almost cash. It took a lot for me to forgive that. Uh, it took of the thirty five years he's been famous and all the joy I got out of their albums. That took about three quarters of it to re- to forgive the sex tape with socks on. But still, uh, and people were going crazy as he's walking through the goddamn thing. It was it was amazing. So I'm waiting for the show, and then finally, I was on the side. I was on any side of the stage, and I just saw Alex walk up the stairs and he gets on and he just gets behind the drum set and just starts playing and then you just hear eddie the fucking guitar and uh and wolf runs out and then each with a different spotlight and then dave walks out carrying like a huge uh not a sword not a kendo stick i guess it was a mic stand but he was twirling it he comes out on stage the place is going crazy and uh eddie does i will all right and he, he's just riffing. He's just playing in there. You know, Dave starts yelling and then the, the, the screen, the video screen shows all four of their faces and they rise out of the, out of the bottom to the top. And then Eddie starts unchained. And it's funny because in the beginning of the tour, uh, you know, I went online, they were opening with you really got me. And I, 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 as I've said, I don't ever need to hear that again from them. Cause for me, it's a kink song. I understand. I heard it first from, you know, from Van Halen. Honestly, when I was 10, I heard Van Halen's version, but it's a kink song. I don't, I don't need to hear them play that anymore. I, I, I'd rather they didn't. So when they were opening with it, I was a little disappointed. Uh, but then they started opening with Unchained about midway through the tour because they were mixing it up every night. And then I think they decided, you know what? Unchained is us because it is. That's the definitive Van Halen song. If anybody asked me for a Van Halen song, fuck the 1984 album, fuck Jump. I, you know, all great. I love them. I love Hot for Teacher. I love Panama. But Unchained is Van Halen. That's it. So that's the song I would play. 
And sure enough, they opened with it and the place went fucking bananas. And Eddie, he sounds so good. It, it, it's... And Wolfie sounds great too. The band and Alex is just because I've seen them. I've seen them bad. All right, I've seen them very bad. I saw them in 2007 when Eddie had holes in his shoes and he had straggly hair that he tied up in a in a top knot and he couldn't play the notes. Like he was fumbling with his guitar. It, it was awful to see because he is someone who you know. I played his music to come to at my wedding. I mean, I I, I love them so much, and to see him at his worst was was just awful but i did it and i paid for it and that's why i'm glad that now i paid to see him at what i think quite frankly was his best because i've seen them like i said i've seen them terrible but i've also seen them great i saw them on the on the diver down tour and i saw them three times on the 1984 tour and i i paid to see those shows and and i've seen eddie with you know sammy on 5150 and um or i'm sorry on uh was it was that album called 5150 i think it was right yeah, I believe so. I, I regardless, who cares? Why am I asking you? Literally, I'm asking you a Van Halen question. Was that what it was called? Okay, you think so? Good. Uh, <laughs> I feel like an idiot, but but I've never seen him as good as I saw him the other night. Uh, he plays his guitar solo about three quarters of the way through. Actually, when he plays it, there's only two songs left. Okay, he doesn't he doesn't take over the middle of the show. He plays his guitar solo at the end. And I used to bitch with Pat Francis because I've seen him a few times now and he's been playing the same solo uh, a lot. He'll play the beginning of Eruption and then he'll drift off and he'll play like Mean Streets sometimes and he'll play Cathedral. He always plays Eruption and Cathedral, but then he'll mix stuff in other intros and other pieces of music. Well, on this tour, he's only playing Eruption and Cathedral, basically. And then but also he's doing a lot with them. He's playing an eight minute solo with those basic two songs. Um. But I, I'll tell you what, he's never sounded better than he did the other night, even playing that solo. Because here's the thing, when we say, oh, he's got a guitar solo and he's playing the same guitar solo, yes, he is. But he's also playing for two solid hours and he, he's all over the place in the songs. If you just listen to him, he's noodling everywhere. He's all over everything and he's playing little riffs and little, like he's throwing off these little pieces of music and it's just so second nature to him when you watch him i can't imagine ever being that good at something uh i can't imagine ever being able to just do that and granted he's been doing it his whole life i mean he, he got good at it by practicing and playing it and getting as good as he did but to just see him throwing off notes and playing and smiling and and just being perfect he was perfect the other night eddie was so perfect every song every intro everything was perfect spot on the solo sounded like the record but also even better because he was playing them live and he added to them I, I was i'm so happy that i paid to see eddie because i did pay to see eddie all right i didn't i didn't give a fuck the band is the band and i've talked on here about how much i love dave and dave has to be there and all those things but i was paying to see the band and i was paying to see eddie because that band is a fucking jet engine and i was so happy to be there to see them conversely uh as good as eddie van halen was that's how bad david lee roth is uh i don't want to say this i wish i wasn't saying it i i know some of you have seen the shows and really really loved them and i loved it i look i would pay to see them another 10 times it was fantastic you have to have dave there he has to be there it's just unfortunate that he can't do the job anymore. He can't sing. I, I, I'm, and I look. I've talked on here, and I've defended him, and I've said over and over. I go, look. It's like it's like a great restaurant. I said he's front of the house. That's all he is. He's keeping you entertained while you enjoy your meal. And in the back of the house is the band, and they're fucking shredding and cooking you the best food you've ever had in your fucking life. And I still feel that way. It's just that maybe I caught him on an off night, but David Lee Roth seemed. And this is the first time I've ever seen it. Okay, he seemed tired tired of his own act i know that sounds weird but he came out and he he said the the same things and he hit the same notes and he said the same jokes and i, I i'll throw this at you too you know growing up with david lee roth he was always kind of a goof all right you know he was silly and there was that part of him but he was sexy and he was dangerous that's what made him the best front man in rock and roll was he was all over the place, running, jumping, doing the splits and kicking and then adding in that hucksterish Vegas, you know, I'm going to fuck your girlfriend. Hey, I'll look at all the people here tonight and all that bullshit. It went good with the other part of him, which was sex God. Well, he's not a sex God anymore. 
He's a 60-year-old man running around like your uncle making silly jokes and showing you videos of his dog on the screen. And it it threw me. It fucking threw me off. I mean, and the, the worst part is, you know, in the old days, Dave Dave's never been able to sing live, all right? Sometimes he did. If you watch the old, like I said, the 81 Oakland show and things like that, he wasn't drunk yet. So he remembered the lyrics and he would sing the songs and they sounded just, you know, a little bit like the records. He was He was all charm. He's all cock. That's what he is. All right. He's all cock and no balls a lot of the time. Well, unfortunately, now, uh, you know, he, he couldn't get it up the other night when I saw him. It was just a drag. Uh, you know, he's he was trying to talk to some. You know, It just sounded rote. And I will tell you this, too. The crowd was not responding to his jokes or to his bits because we're all older. And he's older. So to sit there and see him try to do the same kind of shtick with us, it's almost like, no, dude, be real. Be real. And, but he can't be real. What's it going to be? I'm rich and you're not. I'm happy to be back. I mean, I don't know what I don't know what I wanted from him. Uh, but I do know that what I got from him was not what I'd hoped. Um, I Because I taped some of it on my phone. I, I, I taped the beginning of Unchained. And, uh, you know, the, the I, I, and I will tell you this, too. I, I did a disservice to myself by going on YouTube and seeing so many clips of them and by seeing the set lists because in other cities you know they brought out just a couple days before the show i saw them at they did bottoms up in oakland which they haven't done since 1983 uh they were doing uh hang em high off of diver down and uh you know they were doing all these different songs in different cities well when i saw them they didn't do any of that they did hear about it later which i was so happy about because it's my favorite van halen song of all time and then they did women in love which is uh, uh valerie bertinelli's favorite song uh, which is one of the reasons why they do it because Wolf wanted to play it because it's his mom's favorite song. And so they do that now on the tour. And also Eddie, it's always meant something to Eddie. I think I've told you when he was really drunk, he tried to play it one night and he couldn't do it. It was weird. But now that he can, it's amazing to watch. Um, and I'm rambling. I know I'm rambling, but it's because, you know, again, it was part of my childhood to go and see them and relive it and to love the band so much and to be so, I wouldn't even say put off by Dave, but it was almost like I felt bad. Like I was like, he he can't do it anymore. It's just... And I hated it that it was being validated for me in front of my very eyes. I wanted to go there and have a transcendent experience. I wanted everything to be firing on all cylinders, the band to be amazing and Dave to be great and it to be exactly what I'd hoped and wanted it to be. Well, three quarters of it was. I mean, that band was fucking phenomenal. And I actually taped Beautiful Girls on my phone. And I, I wasn't going to tape the whole thing, but when I started the tape, because I taped the guitar riff, okay, which was huge, and I wanted to hear Eddie playing, but then I wanted, but then Dave starts singing, and it's so bad. I like if I send it to you, I'll, I'll text it to you. He, he just because that's and that song's a speak sing song that he should be able to pull off, but he's trying to do shit that he can't do in it. Same with Unchained. Unchained is a speak sing song, but he's trying to sing, like he's trying to push too much, and so he winds up fucking hitting these sour notes. But then Wolf and Eddie come up and they sing the fucking backup for Beautiful Girls. And they sing the background for Unchained and they sing the background for Women in Love, which is so gorgeous. And then Dave just fucking ruins it. He doesn't ruin it. He didn't ruin anything for me, but it was just, I was just disappointed in him. I actually Twittered, I was going to Twitter. I typed out uh, Van Halen brought back Dave and then replaced Michael with Wolf. I think they should bring back Michael and replace Dave with Wolf. Uh, And I actually typed that out and I was going to hit send and I went, I can't, I can't do that. I can't punch my past in the face like that. Uh, because it was per- it was a great show. I would I wish I was going tonight because Pat he was th- he thought we were still going to be able to go tonight and then he wound up not getting, being able to get tickets. But I would go. I would see them a, a million other times just to be in the room with Eddie playing. I I don't you know Dave is Dave and Dave's there and uh, you know I saw them with Gary. I saw them with Sammy. I would see them with anybody. I don't give a fuck who's singing. I'm there to see Eddie because that's what it's all about for me. And now Wolf, because Wolf was, he was fucking tearing it up on bass. His background vocals were amazing. And the fact that he's got his dad energized and he wants to go ahead and bring all these new songs into the set list, it's so huge. I just wish they would have added more to the set list when I was there. Just, But that's only my own fault because I, I surprised myself. It's a 24 song set list. It's fucking fantastic. And you always leave a concert going, I wish they would have played this. I wish they would have played that. But they played fucking Hear About It Later. They played Women in Love. They played Somebody Get Me a Doctor. All of it was great. It's just, unfortunately, they had David Lee Roth singing it or trying to at least trying to get his way through it um and and i don't mind if he can't sing i don't give a fuck as long as he brings the swagger but he even seemed swaggered out he seemed old he seemed over himself uh he kept trying to kind of flirt with a girl in the front row but he actually repeated a line that was the thing that freaked me out was he he uh he was talking to her and he said something and then he got distracted and said something to somebody else and then he looked down at her and he said he repeated the same thing to her and I was like, holy shit, is, is Dave going see now right in front of me right here? Uh, 
Well, I don't know if he's seen now, but he's certainly forgotten how to sing. Um, but it, but again, I overall loved it, and I would pay full price, and I would see them over and over. But I do it to see the band. Dave is Dave, and Dave's there, and just but just the very fact that Dave is there allows them to play all the songs that I love from those albums. And Dave can talk his way through them, or or you know whatever he tries to do. I'll, you know what's weird? This is the weirdest thing in the world. The hardest song to sing on the night was a song called "I'll Wait," because he actually sings that song, and he was great. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, where's this guy been all night? Like all of a sudden he made a conscious effort to actually sing and concentrate and belt that song. And he was really good. But the other songs, like if you, even the first line of unchained, cause it's just when he comes out and I, once I heard it, it was the first note and he was sour from the jump. And I'm like, Oh no, no. Uh, and, but I loved it. I still loved it. And I would see it a million times over, but it just was so surprising to see that he has lost it to that degree. Um, it was it was wild. So the show ends, and uh, I texted Karen. I'm like, all right, last song because Jump was on, and she said she would be down there around. I said, be down here around eleven to pick me up. So show sure enough ended at like ten to eleven. Jump started, and I text I texted her, and then she's like, car accident on the 101. And I'm like, the 101, because the 101 is not even close to where I am. So if you're on the 101 at fucking 10 to 11, that means you left late. And it's infuriating. Now I'm pissed I didn't drive. It would have been worth the 25 bucks. So then I call her. I'm like, what do you mean with the 101? Where are you? She goes, I'm in Van Nuys. I'm like, oh, dude, are you serious? Because now that's three freeways. She's got to go down to fucking pick me up. But I had to go to work. I still had to go to the fucking job. Uh, And that's fine. I go, I don't care. I'm going to find a deaf dog and hang out outside of Staples. Come and find me. Uh, Because death dogs, I'm sure I've talked about them on here before. Uh, When you walk out of any event in Los Angeles, there are tons of immigrants with push carts selling bacon wrapped hot dogs and they're grilling onions and peppers uh, with them as well. And it is it is so fucking delicious. I mean, it is like it is something you should not eat at all. It's a direct punch to the heart. But who fucking cares? So uh, so I, I walked over. I got a death dog. And I'm wolfing the death dog, eating it. And I should tell you this, I walked over to get a death dog. And as they're cooking them, a guy walks up and he shines a flashlight like on the on the guy selling the things. It was security. Security came to bust the death dog guy. He's like, you're not supposed to be on Staples property. I told you to go across the street. And he's like, all right, well, let me just take care of these guys. And he's like, no, I can't do it. And I, I had handed him my money already. And I'm like, dude, uh, I need a death dog right away or I need my five bucks back. And he's like, well, just follow me, sir. It's no problem. So we walked over and then he stopped. Like He took like eight steps and stopped and started to make my dog and gave it to me. And the security comes back over. He goes, I told you to get off the property. What are you doing? He goes, I am off the property. He goes, no, behind these flower pots. So he had to move behind the flower pots, which is then funny because then the, all like, <laughs> on the curb all of these immigrants are lining the curb selling their hot dogs and you could just push them all into traffic and kill them if you wanted to and steal their hot dogs uh, and, and I'm sure the thought goes through everybody's mind right don't we all think that don't we all think about killing an immigrant and stealing his hot dogs uh, oh wait I'm being fired again um I don't know. I have no idea. But it was just funny to me. They were all ringing the Staples Center. So and security, they, they would bother to come out and check it out. It seems strange. Uh, so there are people hanging out outside eating death dogs and having a good time and they're smoking. And uh, there's this group of people and this guy. He's making fun of David Lee Roth. And uh, he's holding court. There's about 20 people there and he's yelling and he's being loud. And he's dancing like he's doing. He's dancing silly and spinning around. He's going, what the fuck is that, Dave? That's not what I paid to fucking see. You fucking dance around like an idiot. You know, fuck that. And he, and everybody's laughing and they're like high fiving him. And he goes, you know what? I've seen this band so many times. And they used to play just like the CDs. And now they don't. They're fucking washed up, man. I can't believe I fucking came here. And uh, I finished the rest of my death dog. And I walked over and I listened to him talking. And uh he starts, he's yammering about them and he's and everybody's like, yay. And I go, fuck you. <laughs> uh, cause I, uh, I look, if I want to make fun of David Lee Roth, I can make fun of David Lee Roth. You can't make fun of my David Lee Roth. So I said, fuck you. And he goes, Oh, what? And then, uh, some other people clapped because I said, fuck you. And uh, I go, why did you even come tonight? And he goes, because I thought it would be just like the old days. I go, why? They're 60-year-old men. <laughs> kind of like yourself. They've grown like you haven't. And now it's starting to get like, like a little weird. 
And he goes, fuck that. He goes, you know what? If I paid fucking $200 to come in here and see him, I want to see the fucking show I want to see. I go, no, you see the show that they have. That's what they do. That's who they are. It's all over the fucking internet. You could have looked it up on YouTube. If you didn't think it was going to be good, why the fuck did you pay? And, uh, and what's funny to me is security, who had been so adamant about chasing immigrants off with their hot dogs, are nowhere to be found as I'm chewing out this fucking guy in the street. <laughs> And he's got people in his camp who are like, no, man, it sucked. And, and, and there are people who are like backing me and they're like, no, man, it was great. So then it turns into like a taste great, less filling of Van Halen and David Lee Roth right in front of the fucking Staples Center. And he's like, no, you're wrong. You know, fuck that. He's dancing around like a fag. And I go, let me ask you something. How many times have you seen Van Halen? And he's like, I saw him fucking uh, like a like hundred times. I saw him back on the, you know, the fair warning tour. I saw him all the time, man. I saw him with Sammy, but I've seen Dave on his own. And I go, all right, let me ask you this. When has Dave not danced like a fag? <laughs> and he was like frozen. And I go, those are your words, not mine. But when has David not done jumps and kicks and pirouettes and splits? What was it like before? He was wearing spandex. You could see his nuts before. <laughs> Because I was pissed. I was just so fucking mad. It was just like, dude, because again, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of snark. I'm tired of people ripping people. Because again, I'm giving you my unvarnished opinion. I'm also saying I'm happy I paid. I would pay to see it again. And you can make your own decision. And if you liked it, you're not wrong. Do you understand? But if you're going to sit there and just shit on it to shit on it for reasons that are fucking ridiculous. And then he's saying the band. That's what I'm saying. When, when he said that was when I got involved, when he said the band doesn't play like the CDs anymore. I shoved the rest of that duck dog in my mouth and I said, fuck this. We're, I'm, I'm getting involved. Fuck you. <laughs> and I say, so I said, those are your words. You know, I when, when is he? He's done splits. and He's been in a spandex when you could see his balls before. Why? Why is that not a thing now? And he's like, well, you know, he's just dancing around. He can't do the kicks anymore, and he's still trying to do it. I go, yes, he's trying to do it. You just said you paid two hundred dollars to see him. Did you? What do you want him in a chair? He's trying to give you the show that he wanted to give. And he goes, yeah, well, he failed. And I go, well, that's on you. What do you expect out of a fifty-seven-year-old man? He's not thirty-five anymore. And it was like, because I, what was weird is he was just callously making fun of them, and I wanted to discuss it. Like nobody. <laughs> Because he's got 30 beers in him and he's pissed off he spent 200 bucks and he's just making fun and dancing around like a spaz. And I wanted to discuss the, you know, the my nostalgic wants and what I wanted as a child and what I expected and what people do when they age. Like I was just hitting this guy at all ridiculous angles. And, uh, and he finally just looked at me and he was like, well, if you liked it, then that's fine. And I go, that's the bottom line of anything you ever buy. And he just like kind of froze. And this other guy next to me just goes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Almost like a like Carvelli. Like he's like on my side, like, like it dawned. It was this, I didn't, I didn't even think it was that profound, but it was like, cause he's like, you know, whatever. The, and I just, cause that's the, that's the bottom line of anything you ever buy. If you're happy with it, then that's fine. And it was like, everybody just kind of drifted off at that point <laughs> to go get hot dogs. Uh, and it's, you know, it's funny cause I was ready. I was going to argue. I'm like, Hey, look, look at this fucking hot dog. If you bought this hot dog and said it was shitty, you couldn't just sit there and make fun of the guy for fucking an hour. You paid for that. You know what it is. You know what you're getting. You know what you're getting with Van Halen. You know what you're getting with a hot dog. It's all the fucking same bacon wrapped fucking death dog is bacon wrapped hot dog in a bun with grilled onions and peppers. And then it's got ketchup. It's got mayonnaise and it's got a ton of mustard on it. Van Halen is the bacon wrapped death dog of rock and roll. You can love them your whole life, but you need to realize as you get older, they're going to affect you a little differently each time. And the sad part is, you know what? I sort of agree with this dude. That's what pissed me off more than anything. I think, you know what? I think it was guilt at, at me for being upset and not liking Dave. Like I was mad at myself about it. Even though I can have that opinion, I can feel that way. But to see him making fun of it and outwardly making fun, I just want to go, dude, fuck you. That's Van Halen. You fat fuck with your 30 beers and you're out here doing a fake dance and you think you're even close. You can't even fucking handle. You couldn't, you couldn't wear that leather suit. You sh you're not fit to swift the fucking stage that Dave dances on. <laughs> You should get on your knees and buff the fuck out of that floor. That's what you should be begging to do. Get a Swiffer and clean that stage so Dave can entertain us, even though he didn't entertain us, but so fucking what? He entertained everybody else. It wasn't for me. But you know what? I love Van Halen and I love bacon wrapped death dogs. But as I find out this weekend, as I get older, I just don't need nearly as much mustard with either of them. You guys can get me at Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com. You can be my friend at Facebook.com slash The 40-Year-Old Boy. You can follow me at Twitter.com slash The 40-Year-Old Boy. You can follow our friend Lily Von Stupp on Twitter on two accounts. 
Twitter.com slash MNTs and Twitter.com slash Lily Von Stupp. Be her friend at Facebook.com slash Lily Von Stupp. Be our friend David Hernandez, who does all the artwork and music and everything else and makes the show palatable, uh, at Facebook.com slash David Mex Hernandez. Uh, and if you'd like to write Lily a personal note and find out how I was going to cure her sickness several times during the show, <laughs> you can go ahead and write her at Lily at Burlesque411.com. That's Lily, L-I-L-I, at Burlesque411.com. Her name is Hannah Frostman. Her name is Hannah Frostman. Her name is Hannah Frostman. His name is Jeff Hara. His name is Jeff Hara. His name is Jeff Hara. Want to remind you folks about the Monday Night Tees every Monday night at the Three Clubs on Santa Monica and Vine. My friend Lily Von Stubb produces this show and produces that show. Which is better? I am. Who, who else am I asking? Well, here's the thing. You're funnier. It's got tits. It's kind of like comparing a penis and a vagina. I like them both, but for different reasons. Hmm. All right. Sometimes. You feel like you're not? Of course you do. You Why not? All right. So uh, how was last week's show? I, it was packed. It was amazing. That's great. You had the guys from New York come to town and uh, well, the, 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 the whole crew from New York. I found something out about that crew as we were talking before the show. This, uh, they're, all of their names are fonts. Yes. I think that's pretty cool. Well, they were. They're not anymore. What? Yeah. Well, they started out in college, and they were like uh, this college stripper group, and so they all went with, you know. Hold on. Wait. Hold on. Stop. College stripper group. Yeah. Does that exist a lot? Is that happening in a lot of places? Yes. But here's the weird thing. They're the only state-sponsored burlesque group. Because they actually get funding from the state because they have a theater troupe and they're... Uh, yeah, what state? Pretty freaking awesome. New York. So New York pays them to strip, but you can't drink a soda in that fucking town. <laughs> well, there you what go. What the fuck? <laughs> Start spreading the news, folks. I'm, I'm very angry at New York. <laughs> you can drink a soda, you just can't drink a big one. All right. Well, well then, th- that you know what you work for the stripping, too? You can strip, too, but you can't strip a big one. <laughs> uh, so who's coming this week? For graduation for June. Yeah. So All right. Doc and Stumpy are doing a bunch of baggy pants comedy about uh, Father's Day and being fathers and all that kind of stuff. And when that's finally over, what ha- what happens? Every, every girl in the show is a graduate of my burlesque school, Lily School for Wayward Girls. Oh, nice. So we have a bunch of alumni coming back. We've got some debut performers. The thing that's awesome is there are 19 girls in the show. 19. There's 16 acts. Very cool. That's a big show. It's huge. It's it's twice the size of a normal show with 39 boobs. I can never All right. That. All right. There's 39 boobs, so come see who has had a horrible accident, folks. Uh, that's this Monday. Uh, dads and grads. Doc and Stumpy's dads and grads at the Santa Monica and Vine location where the three clubs can be found. Yeah. And that's every Monday night at 10 o'clock. Go to mondaynighttees.com for any other information and ticket sales and brownpapertickets.com is where you can find your tickets. Uh, you can go to facebook.com slash the 40 year old boy and be my friend and also sign up for any of the pages who want to bring me to town. Uh, still working on places like Detroit and uh, all these other, I think, now this is weird. This, uh, I got a notice that somebody had posted on my bring Mike to central Pennsylvania page. Uh, I didn't know there was a bring Mike to central <laughs> Pennsylvania page. Folks, if you start a page, you got to tell me about it so I can plug it. Uh, but yeah, there were people already like writing on it and talking and I, I have no fucking clue. There was a bring Mike to central Pennsylvania page, but good for them. I don't know what's in central Pennsylvania. Is there uh, is that where Pittsburgh is? I hope cause I haven't been, I'd love to go there. Uh, or will I be going to Amish country? Maybe they're bringing me to Amish town. Maybe it'll be a uh, rum scala. Is that what that thing's called? Where the Amish get the week off. What's that? When the kids, the kids get to go out and be real people and like fuck hookers and then come back with like key, a keychain that proves that they're not Amish anymore or they are. Or, I don't know. They're bringing me to town for Rump Scala, folks. I'm very excited about it. But I guess there's a bring mic to Central Pennsylvania page. I haven't seen it. I can't say Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm saying it. I'm saying it too quickly. So I'm saying Pennsylvania instead of the sill. Pennsylvania. Because I lisp. Uh, sadly, I lisp. It's terrible. Go listen back to the show. I'll prove it. 
Uh, so yeah, there's Bring Mike to Detroit. There's Bring Mike to uh, plenty of places. But I should tell you right now, there is a page that has uh, that is it's no longer needed. That's a lie. It's still needed. Sign up for it. But I've already booked a show in this part of the world. Uh, and I'm going back to this part of the world. And I, like I said earlier, I have a feeling that the ticket sales for this are going to be grim, like so grim, but I couldn't pass it up. I had a great offer for a theater and I had been kind of, uh, looking around for a while, but you guys started the page right away after I left. So, Hey, guess what? I'm coming back to Wisconsin, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Bring Mike to Wisconsin. Uh, that page exists and guess where I'm winding up. I know you're thinking, is he coming back to Milwaukee? Is he going to Wausau? Uh, perhaps he's going to Oshkosh? No, folks. Bring Mike Schmidt to Green Bay is in effect. I will be playing in Green Bay, Wisconsin on September 14th. That's a Friday night, September 14th. Now, here's the thing. Here's the plan, folks. Uh, you know, I was, I'm was. i going to be in Green Bay at the Venture Theater. Uh, our friend Mike Yoder, who saw me in Milwaukee, literally the week after the Milwaukee show, offered me the sh- his theater in Green Bay. And I hemmed and I hawed and I looked around. I looked at Madison. I looked at Milwaukee. And uh, also when Mike and I had talked, we had a miscommunication at first, but he was persistent and he was very friendly and very nice. And he really liked what I did in Milwaukee and wanted me to be a part of his uh, theater in venture uh, in a, it's the venture theater in Green Bay. And, you know, I said, finally this week, cause I, one of the things is the room it didn't have tables. It was a lot of freestanding chairs. And I'm like, I don't know if I like that setup. And then I went to Boston and there were no tables and there was a bunch of freestanding chairs. And I went, you know what? This fucking works. I can make this work because you guys are cool enough to come to venues that I'm playing at. And, and really just you're there for the show. You don't give a shit about what's around you. So I'm excited to go to the Venture Theater. And, and then it's funny. I, I spelled out those concerns to Mike and he's like, we've added tables since I talked to you. Uh, we're adding more. We've got these chairs. And I'm like, well, then, you know what, dude? I'm excited. Let's do this. So uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, September 14th, Friday, 8 o'clock show. Uh, I will be there and I'm excited to do so. And I will also tell you that uh, uh, this probably had no small effect on why I'm booking this show in this area of the country. September 13th is a Thursday. Bears Packers, second game of the NFL season in Green Bay. So I don't know if I'm going. I don't know if I can get tickets. I, I have no clue. But the Brewers that are the 12th and the Packers are the 13th. And, uh, and I've already been claimed in Milwaukee. Like, so it's like it's crazy. Uh, but I'm very excited to come to Green Bay and do the shows at the Venture Theater. Shows? That seems odd. How about one show? I'm doing one show at the Venture Theater September 14th. Um, remember that I'm in Toronto June 29th. That's at Comedy Bar at the end of this month, and tickets are, uh, they've kind of stopped moving. I'd appreciate it if you guys bought more tickets. That'd be great. I'd love it. I hope you would, too. I don't even know if i got to change my money. Have you been to Canada? Do I got to change my money before I go to Canada? No? Because I don't know if they take dollars or not. I don't want to show up, and all of a sudden I'm like this you know, alien, and your money's no good here, idiot, and I get arrested for vagrancy, and then fucking the rubber duck has to come and bust me and Spider Mike out of jail. I can't have that. Uh, that's a reverence for nobody. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to be in Toronto June 29th at Comedy Bar. Tickets are available at brownpapertickets.com. Remember, July 27th, I'm in Indianapolis at the Indie Fringe Theater. Tickets are available at brownpapertickets.com. September 14th in Green Bay at the Venture Theater. Remember, tickets are available at brownpapertickets.com. But most importantly, folks, I've mentioned it earlier. I will mention it now late. Kansas City, the Westport Coffee House Theater this weekend. Uh, it's Friday. People are writing me already, and they're like, will there be walk-up tickets available? Fuck yes, there will. Uh, I hope that you guys can come out. I hope anybody can come out. There should be walk-up. T- well, there definitely will be walk-up tickets available. But uh, if you could buy tickets over the next couple days via email or you know, brownpapertickets.com via email, what does that mean? Go to brownpapertickets.com and buy tickets. The online sales will last until Friday morning. And then after that, absolutely, there will be walk-up tickets available at the uh, Westport Coffee House theater show starts at eight o'clock uh talk to them today they uh surprisingly they have a mic stand with a round base surprisingly they also have uh, they didn't have a tech person to help me but they said they could bring somebody in who could help with the music and stuff and that was really nice so uh, i'm excited about that i still don't know if there's anybody who works front of the house because i forgot to ask that uh but that's fine so make sure you come out to kansas city this weekend tickets available at brown paper tickets or available at the door walk-up style watch my facebook page i'll be updating everything on there uh looking forward to coming out i'm on a plane in fucking six hours so that'll be fun uh, remember, you can go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com to the Joe Business page, and available now are the Year One, Year Two, Year Three, and Year Four download sets available now. Uh, you can get them all individually for twenty-five bucks, or buy the complete set, the podcast of the Caribbean set, available for just seventy-five dollars. Who can pass up on Stranger Mikes? I don't think anybody can. 
uh, or a curse of the black Schmidt. How could you not want that folks? Uh, so go ahead and pick a podcast of the Caribbean. Remember to go to Zazzle.com and uh, slash, is it slash 40 year old boy? I don't know if it is. Zazzle.com slash 40. Oh, you know, that's what the song says. Yeah. And you can buy the, uh, go to the links there and get the Fireboy mug or the Thorgar and Yeep mug. Those are available. And also please remember that tweakedaudio.com slash 40 is your place to go for cockering watches and auto erotic asphyxiation earbuds. Uh, it made me laugh that the shady committee did not want anything to do with me when a sponsor that has been with me for almost two years, maybe even more than two years is thrilled with the fact that i market their product for auto erotic asphyxiation and as a cock ring yeah. i wanted to write the shady committee and go hey there was a guy from england who sponsored the show for six weeks i said he built a complex system of cum troughs all around the nation to pick up the runoff from guys jerking off at adult bookstores and he loved it but the shady committee wants nothing to do with it uh, that's fine i suppose uh, so please go to tweakedaudio.com slash 40 and get cock rings and watches and, uh, or, or no, not, oh, cock ring watches, not cock rings and watches, <laughs> cock ring watches and auto erotic asphyxiation earbuds, zazzle.com. Of course, Joe business there is the downloads, uh, one, two, three, and four. And if you want to donate to the show, upper left-hand corner, you can donate to the show. There's a $5, there's a $10, there's a $2. And I don't know if the new one, there's supposed to be a new one up. Uh, but I, I haven't heard from Farmer Ryan. He's going to get back to me soon, I would hope. Uh, but there will be a new donation uh, possibility. What's the, what's the word I'm looking for? A new donation choice? Whatever. Who fuck, who, no one cares. Uh, there will be a, another donation button you can click on and give me money every month, and I'll appreciate it very much. Uh, I need to say a special thank you to two listeners who sent me some stuff via the email, or not via the email, via my post office box. I went and checked it out, and I had uh, a couple of things. One, um, listener Corey Oslin who donated to Kickstarter. I met him in Minneapolis. Good guy. Uh, it, this is weird. He sent me, first he sent me a biography, the autobiography of Road Warrior Animal, who was a wrestler growing up that I loved, and I was so happy. And then I, he's, and he's like, make sure you open it up. And I open it up, it's signed. It's an autographed ah. book from Road Warrior Animal. So I was thrilled. I was, I was so excited to get that. And then in the same package, there were two CDs. And uh, I looked at the CDs, and they were garbage. Like, they were just... <laughs> It was like some Best Buy sampler of jazz guitarists. It was like bullshit. And he's just like, yeah, you know, I was kind of cleaning out my house and I saw those and I thought you might like them or whatever. But I mean, but also, and he just, so he just gave me garbage. Like, really, dude? And I should tell him, good for him. They were smashed in transit. Like, they, their plastic cases were already, like, s smashed into pieces. That's what they deserved, Corey Oslin. <laughs> Although your autobiography of Road Warrior Animal autographed certainly makes up for the inclusion of your garbage. Uh, and I want to thank you for that. I want to thank Stacy Hood, who is a listener who has uh, been in L.A. and offered to take me to sushi if I would meet him in, you know, 100 miles away, whatever the fuck. He had a million different rules. Uh, and then he was going to see me in Atlanta, but then he couldn't. Whatever. Stacy's a good guy, good listener to the show. And he sent me a hard drive, like a small flash drive. And it's shaped like a guitar. And he claims that there's a bunch of Van Halen stuff on it. And he's like, yeah, man, it's all these different files. And I have not uh, had the courage to plug it into a computer just yet because I don't know what the hell's going to happen. I like Stacy. He seems like a good guy. But also people seem to think that I'm like I'm to be made sport of. So I don't I, I'm worried about plugging that into my computer and it's either going to fry everything or it's going to just upload all this German porn that nobody wants. That would be so, uh, I, I mean, it's just, he's like, yeah, man, it's a bunch of Van Halen stuff. May I have fun checking it out. And I'm just like, I'm not putting this in my computer at all. So, so now it's, I have a nice little guitar shaped paperweight on my desk. I'm sure it's got tons of great stuff on it, but I can't bring myself to plug it into my computer. I know that seems ridiculous, but, uh, I just don't know. I mean, who knows? We'll do it next uh, week on mine. We'll do it on the old computer. Oh, all right. Well, that's it. We'll do that. It's an event folks. Yeah, we'll get that. We'll have an event. We'll, we'll unveil whatever Stacy sent me. We'll, and, uh, Lily's fingers crossed for German porn, <laughs> yeah. uh, which, by the way, that's the name of the only German porn I've ever seen. Fingers crossed. Don't <laughs> ask what happened. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll root for Van Halen stuff, so we'll see. I don't know. It should be fun to check out. But thank you, Corey Oslin. Thank you, Stacy Hood, for sending me things. And uh, if you guys want the P.O. Box, go ahead and write me uh, anywhere at MikeSchmidtComedy.com. It's Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com or via Facebook, and I will send you the address, and you can send me stuff, and then I'll, I'll be a coward and not use it or do anything with it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and now, folks... Let me introduce the rerun of the show that I was going to had uh, I had locked and loaded for you that I was going to play. I want to make sure to tell you uh, that last year uh, on Father's Day, 
I did an episode about uh, what happened with my dad growing up. And then also that there was an incident where uh, the second story was somebody climbed into my car and it turned into a thing. And this was an episode that everybody, uh, it kind of connected with people. And everybody said, dude, you should put that episode back up again. You should have that episode up for everyone to listen to because that would guarantee people getting hooked on your show. And with Father's Day this week... Uh, I've decided, you know what, this is a perfect time for it. So I'm going to go ahead right now uh, and just, Lily, you're going to cue that up for us. So Lily's going to go ahead and put up uh, the episode for Father's Day from last year. It was called That's My Process, Kathy. Uh, because our friend Kathy had written me to find out about how I did the show. Whatever, you'll hear it. It's coming up right now. So it's uh, it's a story about stuff that happened to me when I was a kid with my dad, and then it also tied into something that happened to me that week. So uh, I hope uh, you enjoy it. I'm glad that you guys are uh, always telling me you want to hear it again. So I'm excited. Because I have a tone. Because you know why? Because I talk quickly and I don't I don't fucking think. That's why. I think that's what it means when you have a tone. Is you don't fucking bother to care what comes flying out of your goddamn mouth. I try to grow the show and I want people to get on board and they're like, eh, I listen to it and you talk too fast. Really, I talk too fast. How the hell else am I supposed to cram all of this into a small three-hour window? Dude, this is there's no script. I just go with this shit on the fly. It makes me laugh. If it doesn't make you laugh, turn the fucking station. And by turn the station, I mean turn the wheel of your car right into a guardrail. Jesus, fuck. Hey, wh- wh- where are you? Where are you going, boy, boy? 